Welcome Libby Manor Church family. We are so happy that we are here with you today and that you are here with us. Welcome to the Living Manna Church uh, service today. We have an amazing program that God has put together. It is our prayer that you will be blessed by uh, today's service. This is a great time to share on your social media that you are in church and invite your friends and family to church with you today. Uh, because this is the day that the Lord has made and we will be glad and worship him in this day because this is his Sabbath. And so we are thankful to be here with you and we are so happy that you were here with us. Please let us know where you're watching from. And if this is your first time, let us know where you're watching from and put a one to let us know it's your first time so we can say a very special welcome to you and give you more information about the church. Yeah, we want to uh, definitely just extend that welcome to all of our visitors, all of our members. Um, we've got a good service today by the grace of God. Yes. And um, just uh, we decided to do a question and answer today for our Sabbath school. Yes, we did. And I think y'all thought of some of the, you know, most complicated. <laughs> I thought you had some hard ones. I mean, mine aren't. You know, complicated questions to ask like yes. everybody <laughs> so every question for They're me like, is pastor gonna, you want a question i'm gonna give you a question yeah, yeah. every question that i that i will answer today will take i don't know you know it is going to take a little while so okay okay um, then we'll sprinkle some mental health we'll sprinkle in some mental health okay. in between but uh, again we just want to wish you uh, uh, uh we want to welcome you and um we pray that today's uh worship service will be a blessing for you and we'll draw you closer to Jesus. Yes, Amen. we have, let's see, we have Jody, of course, our dear sweet Jody uh, from Vancouver uh, Island in Canada. Good, always good to see you, Jody. Welcome. And she's a bo faithful board member as well of Living Manage Church. We have Kathy from Washington, I believe Washington State. So it's not too far from you, Jody, just kind of right there on the border. Um, yes, so please continue to put in the chat where you're viewing from so we can say a special welcome to you. Haven't seen any first timers yet, but if this is your first time worshiping with Living Man Church, please let us know by putting a one in the chat. And welcome Rob and welcome Clint and welcome Deborah and Gina. We see you, Janice. Yes, and Janice from Belize, welcome, welcome. You know, um, I have to say that this is truly a loving church family and it is wonderful to do, just to do, just to worship God with you um, because it was, it was a great experience last night. We did have a memorial service for our dear brother, Sean Cox, and it was, tr it was a blessing. It was such a blessing. Um, it's the first online memorial that I've ever attended and I was as emotional as I would have been in person mm -hmm. um, just to um, just, you know, to connect with dear sister Crystal, his wife, um, one of his daughter, um, Sky and his sister. It was just, you know, it was, it was just nice. And to other friends who knew him prior. And then, of course, church members had their experiences to share. And we really honored his life. Yeah. We really honored his life and who he was. Um, who he was. And so we're just thankful that, I'm thankful that I've had an opportunity to know him um, and to get to know um, his family as well. It definitely has blessed our lives. It blessed, it, he was a blessing to Living Man at Church. And he continues to be a blessing because we will always remember the things that Brother Sean said all the time that really, you know, just always to hype us up about how good mm -hmm. God is and never to get down because Satan is not going to get the victory. Jesus reigns, mm -hmm. you know, hallelujah, Jesus reigns. So uh, we can always just hold on to those memories and um, just even his example of just being so transparent, but wanting to do anything God asked him to do, anything. And so it was really um, a blessing and um, I just praise God. Just praise God for that yeah. experience. Yes. I've been talking, so I've missed some, but welcome to all of those. Have you been tracking? <laughs> I've been tracking. Our, 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 welcome, everybody. Yes, welcome to everybody. If you see somebody new in the chat, just yes. uh, make sure to greet them and uh, let them feel welcome. Yeah, we have more from Van, uh, Vancouver and then Jamaica, Maryland and Jamaica. Welcome. 
Good to have you here. Yes, it's good to have everyone. I just want to talk about my shirt while people maybe still putting it. It's, it is. God is good. God is good. All the time. All the time. And even though I already shared about Brother Sean, I just think it, it, this shirt just kind of resonated with me this morning that even though I know we're all grieving, the church is grieving, but the family, his wife, the children, uh, the sisters, just everyone who knew Sean is grieving. But even um, in these situations, God is still good. I have to say that um, there's always something positive that we can find um, even in these dark spaces that this world tries to bring us in. And mm -hmm. so I talk about that often, these dark spaces. There is light at the end of the tunnel. It's not even at the end. Even when you're in a dark situation, um, God is shining a light on you in your heart to keep you uh, strong and, uh, and to keep you strong and together even in these hard times. Mm -hmm. So you know, grief is a grief is a, a journey, and it doesn't look the same for everyone. Um, it's 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 different for everyone, and so um, just letting yourself um, just remember that God is good, and allowing yourself to grieve in the way that um, that works for you, um, and just trusting in God and clinging on to God to keep you through this space. We will be able to say at the end, God is good. God is good all the time, and He truly. He really is. Amen. He really is. So we just praise him. And yes, I don't know if we missed some as I'm talking, but um, welcome again to everyone. We are just thankful to be back here with you on this Sabbath. Um, and I want everyone to know that, you know, Mental Health Mondays, we actually, we took a little longer hiatus than we planned to. <laughs> uh, that's partially my fault, not Dr. White's fault. <laughs> um, but we are going to be back know. this Monday, this Monday. And uh, I'll talk to you more about that in the Divine Worship. And we're going to be um, covering his new book. Um, it's talking about um, burnout and how to... Uh, just not allow yourself to burn out and the things that you can do so you don't burn out. And so we all, we can all benefit from that information. I mean, everyone has so much going on and um, sometimes life just burns us out because yeah. it's just what life does and all the different areas of life that being a, being a spouse, being a parent, uh, an employee, uh, being a faithful church member, you know, all of these yeah. things can like burn you out if there's uh, not boundaries, but I don't want to get into his book. I want you guys to tune in on Monday because we'll be talking about that. Dr. White and his um, co-author will be, will be sharing. So that's going to be good. So be looking out for uh, the link for Mental Health Mondays um, this coming Monday. And? <laughs> Is it time? Oh. Is it time? Okay, to no, pray. No, 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 no. It is. I'm just, I was. I did that to see if you had any announcements you wanted to talk no, about no. before we went in. My mind is just locked in on these questions. Okay, so yeah. These these <laughs> these are some massive questions. He's yeah. like, let's get to it. Let's get to it. All right. Well, <coughs> let's pray. Let's pray to let you know we're probably not going to. I mean, he has some heavy duty questions. I have uh, some mental health questions, but you could still put in the chat. Yeah. If you want to email them, I'll be checking my email while he's answering, but that's a tante at livingmana.church. And we'll put that in the chat as well uh, so that you guys can email mental health questions. I think Bible questions, he's pretty full for today. So we're just going to leave it what you have. <laughs> and, uh, but mental health and, questions, uh, mental health, yeah. um, and it can be on relationships and marriage and family and all of those things as well. Yeah. And we may just try to maybe have an ongoing Mm -hmm. question um because you may not get to them all today format where people can write their questions in um so that we you know we'll have a list of questions that we will answer whenever we do our question and answer session yes uh, so you don't have to wait to send your question in send it right in and, and we can we'll go to that bank of, of questions. questions yeah but it's always nice when we announce we're doing it so they can know your questions yeah. being answered so yeah. yes okay with that said we're gonna pray okay Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you, Lord, today for your love towards us all. We thank you for your grace, your mercy. And uh, Lord, we're just praying today that as we uh, get into these questions, that your name will be glorified, that uh, the answers people are seeking, uh, they will find, uh, because you've promised um, 
knock and it shall be opened unto you. Ask and it shall be given. So um, we come to you now, Lord, with that prayer in mind. And again, uh, just ask that you bless this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I'm going to let you open up. Okay. <laughs> Your first question. All right. So the first question is regarding uh, Passover. So it's a pretty long question. It's a several questions. But I think the, if we were to summarize a question, it's why don't we keep Passover, but we keep the Sabbath. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it says, we talk much about the Sabbath, how it's the only commandment that states remember, and that is specifically the Lord's Day and not and not uh, just for the Jews. Jesus honored it, and the Bible tells us that it is to be and will be honored forever. Uh, then it goes on to say the Passover feast is so very similar and also declared to do in remembrance. Um, and then there are several scriptures that are given as to um, why it seems that, you know, we should be keeping the Sabbath, the uh, the uh, Passover, Passover as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then the question is asked, uh, several questions. Question one, where is the Lord's Supper or communion found in the Bible? Uh, isn't it speaking of Passover? Number two, the broken bread is Christ. Uh, it, isn't the broken bread the symbol of Christ's sacrifice? And uh, isn't that to, uh, isn't the idea to eat the Passover meal in remembrance of him? And then finally, where who instituted the tradition of communion in place of Christians honoring the Passover? Uh, and why don't we study the intricate symbols of the Passover um, to see how it points to salvation and the sanctuary? Okay. So that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a deep question. It's a complicated question. But I'm going to try to uh, break this down so that uh, we can understand the difference between the Sabbath of the Ten Commandments and the Passover as well as the other festivals. Because if we're talking about Passover be, you know, needing to be kept, then what we're actually talking about is all the festivals. If the Passover should be kept, then all the festivals should be kept. Um, there are some important differences with the Sabbath um, between the Sabbath and between these other festivals, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, Pentecost, Day of Atonement, uh, Feast of Tabernacles, uh, Feast of Trumpets. So one major difference is that the Seventh-day Sabbath was not bound by location. Mm. The seven-day Sabbath can be kept anywhere in the world. The feast days, if you read the, the, the uh, instructions given regarding the feast days, um, they were to be given, they were to be observed in connection with sacrifices. So you couldn't just keep the Passover without a sacrifice, nor could you keep unleavened bread or first fruits. Uh, all of these festivals were connected with sacrifices at their inception, whereas the Sabbath was not, there, was not, there, was, there wasn't a sacrifice required to keep the Sabbath. So number one, the Sabbath could be kept anywhere um, in the world, whereas these other festivals had to be kept in Jerusalem and particularly in connection with the sacrifice as well as in connection with the temple. In fact, um, you remember the story of um, when Jerusalem, when the tribes of Israel split into two different tribes. So the northern tribe, the northern king kingdom, and the southern kingdom. And I'm going to read to you in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 26. The Bible says, And Jeroboam said <clears throat> in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold, thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. 
and he set the one in Bethel, and he put the other in Dan. And the text goes on to describe how they began to set up their own feast days, their own uh, 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 festivals, so that the people wouldn't go to Jerusalem to worship. So what was the problem with that? Um, the problem with that is found in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 2. I'm going to read this. It's going to take a little while to read, but let me just go ahead and read. In Deuteronomy 12, verse 2, it says, You shall utterly destroy all the places where, where in the nations which you shall possess serve their gods, unto the high mountains and unto the hills and unto every green tree. In other words, they were, doing, they, were, they, were, they were worshiping their gods and setting up these altars all over the place. You shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars, uh, destroy their gods. Verse 4, you shall not do so unto the Lord your God. Now notice verse 5. But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of your, all your tribes to put his name, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither shall you come. Thither shall ye bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and your heaves offerings, and your vows, and your freewill offerings, and your firstlings and your herds of all your flocks. And you shall eat there before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice in all that you put your hand unto. Now notice verse 8. You shall not do after all the things which they do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. So in Deuteronomy chapter 12, God specifically says, you're not to keep the Passover, you're not to keep these festivals and these observ observances anywhere you want. You must observe them in Jerusalem at the temple. The Sabbath had no such restriction. So we fast forward down to the New Testament time and Jesus is keeping the Passover at the temple. You read throughout the whole Old Testament. They were always going to Jerusalem to keep the Passover. When the Mosaic laws were nailed to the cross, in other words, when Christ comes to die and he fulfills the Mosaic law, which then in turn is nailed to the cross, the greatest signal that the law had been done away with, and are you guys having difficulty hearing? So see you, I've seen a couple of comments that the sound is low. Um, I have only saw two, so I have to okay. continue on. Yeah. So um, the greatest signal of what was done away with and what remained is this. In 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, everything connected with the temple, everything that was bound to the temple, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, tabernacles, day of Pentecost, all the sacrifices, all the Sabbaths that could not be kept outside of Jerusalem or the temple, all of those things were done away with. It was going against the will of God to keep those festivals outside of Jerusalem and outside of the connection of the temple. You couldn't just go wherever you wanted to go and, hey, I'm going to keep this, I'm going to keep that. No, they had to be kept in Jerusalem. So, the Sabbath being universal in nature, doesn't matter where you are, you can keep the Sabbath anywhere, you don't need to sacrifice to keep the Sabbath, is on a totally different level, context, than the Passover and all those other feasts. Now, are there object lessons and lessons that we learn from the Passover, first fruits, unleavened bread? Absolutely, those lessons are still valid. But in order to keep the Passover, according to the Bible, there must be a sacrifice of an animal. Mm. It must be kept in Jerusalem. It must be kept in connection with the temple. And to do otherwise is to actually go against what God commanded. So this is why we no longer keep those festivals, but we do keep the Sabbath. <clears throat> An important thing to remember is that Gentiles, in order to, to, to have access to these festivals, had to be circumcised, number one, and had, to be, and had to go to Jerusalem to keep it, to, 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 to observe these festivals. But because the gospel was to go to the whole world and to spread to the Gentiles, 
I mean, praise God that we no longer need to go to Jerusalem. We no longer need a literal temple in Jerusalem. We no longer need to sacrifice animals. All those things mm. were done away with at the cross. But because the Jews were like, well, we don't care. We're going we're gonna to keep doing it. When, when God allowed the temple to be destroyed in Jerusalem in 70 AD, that was it. Yeah. You could no mm -hmm. longer keep a Passover. Mm -hmm. You could no longer sacrifice. Right. All those things were done away with. Okay. So hopefully that answers yeah. detailed answer. But Good question and good answer. Yeah, good question. And this is the reason why we set aside the seventh day Sabbath of the Ten Commandments from all these other ceremonial feast days, mm -hmm. which were ceremonial. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do it without a sacrifice. Right. Right? Okay. Okay. So, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with remembering these, these days either. Okay. But you cannot... I was going to ask that. Yeah, you can't actually keep the day. Right. You right. can't actually observe the not day... Not in the way that it was outlined in the Bible. In the Bible. Right. Not like, so you, now can, everybody not like just, you can do this after. Yeah. Now everybody just makes up how you're going to keep the Passover. Well, you know, I'm going to eat the lamb. Uh, I, you know... Everyone now does what is right in their own eyes, which is not how God designated these days to be kept. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. So we have, we have mental health questions. And again, if you have a mental health question, um, mental health or relationships, you can put it in the chat. Um, I do have some that have been emailed in as well. So I wanted to start with this one. It says, how can someone stop overthinking? Uh, first of all, overthinking is a characteristic or it's a part of anxiety. I like to say it's all one thing. Like if you're overthinking, it's because you're, you're worried. It's like you're, you're, you're moving, you're moving ahead, which anxiety is, is worried about the future. Depression is sad about the past, right? But anxiety, you're, you're overthinking because you're not allowing yourself to just be present. Mm. Um, so one of the ways, one of the ways in dealing with overthinking, um, is to, man, I say this, man, when I'm in this, when I'm in this, where I am right now <laughs> in a church service, when I say the word mindfulness, I'm always afraid people are going to take it like to mean something that it's not, not. So practicing mindfulness just means just sitting down in a nice quiet place with maybe a nice cup of tea, you know what I'm saying? There's just something just in a relaxing space, just allowing yourself to just breathe and relax. Just breathe. You cannot and not overthink all these different situations that are going on because you can't, you're overthinking because you're more than likely can't control something. So you have to learn how to breathe, relax, and to release because you can't control a situation. Um, only you can only control yourself. So you don't overthink yourself. You, you basically say, okay, if I, if I think something or want something to happen, I have the control over myself to do it, I'm gonna do it. But you can't control other people or situations. So you need, so, so one way to deal with overthinking is to uh, just take time, quiet time. It could be, if you wanna say, not mindfulness, if you just wanna say prayer and talking to God, but not like a, an anxiety talking to God, an anxious talking to God. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Just allowing God to calm you and relax you and just bring everything down um, and so that you are just peaceful in that present moment, um, just making calm, wise decisions, um, knowing that you can't remind yourself that you cannot control everybody else. You can only control yourself. And so you don't have to overthink or be anxious about what other people's reactions or what they're thinking and doing. And that's really what overthinking is. You're wondering like, oh, what did she think? Or what was in her mind? Or what did she, you know, or, or, or did that situation mean this and that? And it's like, you're in a, you're just like on a, is it the little mouse or they on mm -hmm. those little wheels? You're just on that little wheel, just going and going and going and going. And you're not peaceful. And God wants to give you perfect peace. So allow him to give you perfect peace. But spend some time, if you know that your one of your big issues is overthinking, spend some time in prayer. Do some just quiet time and just like 
the, the silent time with God, the silent time and letting him just write upon your heart and your mind and set your course for that day in a peaceful way. And if you need to take some timeouts during the day, because you know, you might do that in the morning and then you get to work and some things happen and then that overthinking wants to creep back up, do some more quiet mindfulness right there at your desk. Nobody has to know what you're doing. But wherever you are, just calm yourself down, reel in those overthinking thoughts, connect yourself back to your source of strength, which is God. And that's a beginning stage of dealing with some overthinking. Yeah. All right. Okay. Amen. Don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, our next question is, it's a very popular question, but I'm going to give an answer that I think will, will put things into perspective, uh, hopefully, and um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this particular question. But here it is. Uh, how do we know for certain that the world is not millions of years old as claimed by scientists? Um, okay, so put a one in the chat if you've asked yourself this question before, uh, or if you've had someone ask you this question before. Uh, how do we know for certain that the world is not millions of years old um, as, sci as claimed by scientists? Okay, so here is a, here is a very simple answer. When God created Adam, let's say it's day one for Adam, and let's say that you happen to be there, right? You just happen to maybe be there and you're able to talk to Adam, um, and you were to ask Adam, hey, Adam, how old are you? What would Adam's response be? What would Adam's response be? In fact, if you saw the creation, you would know that Adam is how old? If you were to ask him on the day that he's created, how old are you? Adam would be how old? Put it in the chat. And I know there's a little delay, uh, so I'll just, uh, I'll wait, I'll keep, I'll kind of keep pushing this question till I see the answers come in. How old is Adam? on the first day that he is created. Okay, and that very good. Janice, yep. He's one day old. He's one day old. All right, is Adam a baby? Is he a toddler? Is he an infant? Is he a suckling? No, 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 no. He, he is a fully grown man. So when God created, when God makes the creation, when God makes Adam, he might look like he's, I don't know. I mean, today we would say, you know, you're in your prime and like, you know, maybe mm -hmm. 25, that's, that's considered young. But if Adam was 500 years old, mm -hmm. if he looked like he was 500 years old or a thousand years old and he was expected to live forever, he would be, he would look older than he actually is. Mm. So same thing with the animals, same thing with the sun. The moon. When God creates, he creates the thing as a fully mature thing. And then he said, go be fruitful and multiply, right? Um, but if we consider that, the way God made Adam, he was older, he was fully matured, then apply that same principle to the earth. So when scientists are measuring the earth and they're going, oh yeah, the earth is this, you know, mm -hmm. is this old, um, which means there's no creation account because uh, the creation account happened in six days. Well, how is Adam a full grown man mm -hmm. in one day, one day of his, in the first day of his creation? Right. Right? So simply put, God created the earth 
in its full maturity. He created Adam and Eve. He created the animals. He created the, 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 the stones, the trees, everything in their full um, maturity, in perfection. Mm -hmm. That being the case, we can consider that while scientists look and say, oh man, the earth is really, really, really old, therefore there's, you know, it wasn't created in six days, that reasoning won't hold up if you accept the, the Bible as, as the inspired book of God, as a Christian, you don't have to go, oh, well, man, that disproves a creation account. Okay? So um, hopefully that is a simple answer to a question that is asked all the time. Uh, in the Bible account, yes, Clint, everything was already right. Right? Adam looked like he could have been who knows, 500, 1,000 years old, mm -hmm. who knows? Mm -hmm. But he's really only one day. Okay? All right. If I, let me know if I need to expound on that. Do I need to explain that again? Do I need to simplify that? Very simply, if we use Adam as a type of God's creation, as, a, as an example of God's creation, when Adam came forth from the hand of God, he wasn't a baby. He was a fully grown man. And if we were to look at Adam today and go, hmm, how old was Adam? And we just have a picture of Adam. We'd probably say, yeah, Adam looks like he's in, you know, if we're thinking in, in our time. Adam looks like he's about uh, 25, 35 years old. He's not 35 years old. He looks 35 years old, but he was really only one day old because God made Adam in full maturity. Same yeah. thing with the earth. True. The earth may look like it's mm. billions and billions of years old. No, God just made the earth in its full maturity. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. If it makes sense for me, hopefully it makes sense for everybody else. <laughs> yeah. I think so. Okay. Amen. All right. Um, all right. So we have another. This is a... Um, family question, um, but we have a mental health family question. All right. So this says, my husband and I have a dilemma when it comes to keeping the, faith, the fifth sorry, commandment to honor thy father and mother. My husband's mother has repeatedly done some things to my husband and me to the point we have not talked to her in two years. The very last thing she had done was the last straw for us. Um, my, my husband, let's see, has told her numerous times not to do certain things that could be harmful to her and others, but she never listens. It has caused, um, my husband and I so much stress and has, has affected both of our health physically and mentally. We do love her and we pray for her daily, uh, but we just simply cannot be in this type of chaos anymore. Our question is, um, are we possibly breaking the fifth commandment by not talking to her. We want to honor God and do the right thing by keeping all 10 commandments, but not out of fear, but in love for Jesus. Um, we've just, uh, we, are, we are just confused about what we should do or not do. All we know is we can't handle the stress of this mom anymore. All right, great question. Great question because um, this situation, maybe not exactly like, but very similar to happens, unfortunately, and a lot of families and especially connected to parents. I mean, that's sad uh, to say, and I can see why there would be some confusion where a Christian would be like, well, wait, it says to honor your father and your mother. And it's almost like, does that mean we can allow the father and mother to do whatever they want and we cannot say anything or remove ourselves out of an unhealthy situation because of the fifth commandment? No. <laughs> I, yeah, that says honor your parents in the Lord. True. Yes, you're right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, it says that. Um, it doesn't mean don't honor your parents, you know, like you're not in the Lord, I don't have to honor you. But if they're, if they're doing things that are, I don't mean to take your answer. No, over, no, no, go ahead. Just saying, if they, <laughs> You know, if a parent is like, hey, I need you to go rob a bank for me and remember the fifth commandment, honor your parents, right? Right. Yeah. But even with that, this is where, even with that, you can have Christian parents that are like, yes, we're Seventh-day Adventist Christians. We raised you as, we're Seventh-day Adventists. And, and 
Um, so you think, well, they're, they're with God, they're in the Lord, right? Or they're Christians, they're following God. Um, but even in that, sometimes toxic situations arise. And so the behavior of the parent to the adult child um, is not is not the is toxic behavior. And so, are you supposed to allow yourself to be in a toxic situation like this person said that harms you physically and mentally? No. But but like you said at the end of your uh, at the end of your message, you said, but we still love her and pray for her. That's what God is calling for you to do. Meaning like you see the situation for what it is and you can't control her. So you can't make her change or be a certain way, but you can still love her and pray for her from a distance. So you're basically laying down and setting a boundary. You're, I say this all the time. I'll probably say this every time we have this question and answers because so many things go back to being able or having the strength and the spiritual maturity enough to lay down a, a proper boundary that's a boundary to protect yourself, but it's also a loving Christian boundary to the other person, meaning you're not trying to hold resentment and hatred in your heart towards that person. You're still, because that just, heart, that just hurts you anyways. So you want to still have love for them and pray for them, but if you need to set a boundary and remove yourself, it's just like any other situation with anybody else. If the parent is not treating you as a Christian loving parent should treat you and it's harmful to you, then you can remove yourself. Parents, we can, we can get our parent card revoked, if you will, if we're not willing to use it properly. As children and as an adult children, we are not to just allow ourselves to be in, in a situation that is harmful physically, mentally, spiritually, whatever it is, just because that is your parent. Like that's, God doesn't tell us that anywhere in the, in the word. Like the, we still as parents have a responsibility to treat our children, young children and adult children with respect and with love. And if that's not happening, then our responsibility for ourselves is to protect ourselves and to do that in a loving way, but still setting a boundary. Sometimes people, people pleasers have a hard time with this. They think boundaries are mean. Boundaries are not mean. Boundaries do not have to be laid down in a mean way. They can be, you can be firm, kind, and loving all at the same time. So hopefully <clears throat> that helps. You are not breaking the fifth commandment. Amen. Amen. By setting boundaries. By yeah. setting boundaries. By setting boundaries. Um, okay. Let me add here. Uh, as Christians, we should still seek to to reconcile, um, you know, if my brother sinned against me uh, seven times, how many times should I forgive him? Or should, seven times mm -hmm. should I forgive him? And Jesus said, uh, you should forgive 70 times seven, right? So um, we should always be willing and ready to forgive. Um, but again, boundaries um, are not a violation of the law of God. No, right? They're not a violation. Not. You're not doing something wrong. If, if uh, you set a limit to, what pe to how people you know, either take advantage of you or you know, things of that nature, do things that, that hurt. And boundaries can also be helpful to, to the other the, person because yeah. they're actually like, wow. It almost could be like a wake-up call to them to say, oh, you, I'm treating you bad, or you feel like I'm treating you bad, or, 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 you know, they just, it's like a shock, almost like a shock treatment, or, you know, because they're like, wow, I'm not able to do this anymore. So it can be helpful to that person. It can be helpful to the person to want to take, to take a look at what they're doing, take it seriously, and by God's grace, change their ways. Yeah. Okay. Um, so... We're going to go to the next question, which, again, is another pretty involved question. But here's a question. Um, could you explain Leviticus 16.5 in light of Leviticus 16.8? In verse 5, it seems to say an offering like both goats represent one offering. But in verse 8, it differentiates between the two goats. People use verse 5 as proof that both goats represent Christ. 
but verse 8 says differently. So how do you explain verse 5? Okay, so let me, let me unpack this question. Um, it is relating to the Day of Atonement, which uh, um, as Adventists, we teach that there were two goats, or let me say this. We believe the Bible teaches that in Leviticus 16, there were two goats that were used on the Day of Atonement. Uh, one goat was a representation of Christ or Christ's work, and the other goat was the scapegoat, which we believe is Satan, represents Satan himself, Azazel. Now, if you were to just look at, a lot of people think this is an Adventist teaching. This is not an Adventist teaching. If you look at some of the church, the, the so-called church fathers, um, and see what they taught about Azazel, the scapegoat, you will see that they identified Azazel as Satan. If you look at uh, Azazel in the, you know, in, from a Jewish setting, what do the Jewish scholars say about Azazel? They believe Azazel is, the, is Satan. If you go online and Google Azazel, you will see tons of stuff come up about Satan, demonic spirits, uh, uh, evil spirits. So when, when Christians from other backgrounds are like, oh, Adventists are crazy, they say that the scapegoat Azazel is Satan, they're either saying this in ignorance, not knowing how prevalent the idea that Azazel is a symbol of Satan is, um, or they're maybe purposely, I don't think anyone's purposely, I'm just going to leave it at ignorantly. They're ignorantly thinking, oh, this is an Adventist thing, because they're like, you know, no animal in the sanctuary is used to represent Satan. All the sacrifices in the Old Testament system point to Jesus. So, let me read uh, Leviticus 16, verse 5, the verse that was brought up. It says, And he, that is the priest, shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one for a burnt offering. So the idea here is, well, if these two goats are both for sin offering, then both of these have to point to Jesus because Jesus is the sin offering. Now, this is true. Jesus is the sin offering. But the word here for sin offering uh, is the Hebrew word chata, and here's what it means. Um, an offense, sacrifice, expiation, or an offender. And then it goes on to say punishment of or for sin. So what the text is saying is that these two goats were going to be offered as a punishment for sin. So if the two goats will both suffer punishment for sin, we already know that Jesus was punished on behalf. He suffered our punishment. We know that. The question is, will Satan be punished for sin? Yes or no? Put a one in the chat if y'all think Satan will be punished for sin. Put a two in the chat if you do not think Satan will be punished for sin. Because if Satan's not punished for sin, but humans are, wow. Yeah, that, 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 that's, that's pretty, pretty deep. Ma that's pretty messed up. That's pretty deep. That would be pretty profound. That would be un the unfair, the height of unfairness. So we know then that Jesus suffered for our sins, but we also know Jesus was punished for our sins, which are not his, how much more, how, how, how much more just would it be for the originator of sin to be also punished for sin? Let's read on. Let's read on. Uh, in fact, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, the Bible says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment. Now, here's an interesting thing. The goat was to be led out into the wilderness. So what does it mean, led out? Did they take the goat um, by the horn and lead the goat out? No. They had to wrap 
a cord around the, the neck of the goat to lead the goat out into the wilderness. The goat's not just going to be like, hey, let me follow you out. They had to lead the goat out into the wilderness. So it's interesting here that 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 says that, that, that Satan and his angels are reserved in chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And in Revelation 20, what we have is Satan, the Bible literally saying that a chain binds Satan and, lead, and, and, and an angel leads him out into a desolate place, which would parallel what's happening in Leviticus 16. In Leviticus 16 and verse 8, here's what it says. Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one <coughs> lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat, or for Azazel, meaning one goat was designated to represent the Lord. One goat was for the Lord, the other goat was for Azazel, or for the scapegoat. So if we take this idea that both goats were going to suffer, both goats were going to be punished for sin, but one goat is for the Lord, in other words, one will suffer on behalf of the Lord. Or one will suffer that is representing the Lord, and the other will suffer representing Azazel, the scapegoat. If they're both for the Lord, there's no reason to cast lots to decide which goat is going to suffer which fate. Mm. So the fact that one is for the Lord means that the other is not, not for the Lord. God. Right. That's pretty common. It's pretty common. Mm -hmm. It's pretty basic. Mm -hmm. One dies, there's shedding of blood in one. In the other, there's no shedding of blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Mm -hmm. Last thing I'm going to share on this point is this. In Leviticus 16, verse 16 and 17, the high priest was to make an atonement for the holy place because of, uh, of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins, so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Verse 17, there shall, there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. So the priest was to make an atonement for, for his household and for all the congregation. Now, now watch this, verse 20. And when, she, when he shall have made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat and shall lay both hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them on the head of the scapegoat and not kill him, but send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness and the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited and he shall let the goat go in the wilderness. What I want you to notice here is this, that the high priest, according to verse 20 and 21, or I'm sorry, according to verse, yeah, verse 20, has already finished making reconciliation for the people and for the tabernacle for the congregation of Israel. When he is finished, that means the atonement for them is over. Hmm. It is done. It is finished. So the laying on of the hands onto the scapegoat occurs after atonement is completed, meaning this goat plays no part in the forgiveness of sins for the people. This is something totally different happening with this goat. What counted already happened with the first goat. Hmm. What's happening now with this second goat is something different. The sins that were placed upon that first goat then transferred to the sanctuary are now put upon this scapegoat signifying that Satan will be the one that ultimately 
suffers the final punishment mm. because of the sins he committed in the first place, mm -hmm. because of the sins he led people to commit in the first place. He is the one. Think about this, y'all. How unfair would it be for one who had no part in our sin to suffer? Mm -hmm. That was not justice, y'all. That no. was mercy. Right. In the heat, in the, in the goat that represents Jesus, what we see is mercy and grace. Mm -hmm. We don't see justice because justice would have been, we die for that, mm -hmm. not Jesus. Right, right. So in the first goat, you see justice. I mean, you see mercy. You see grace. Yes. In the last goat, ah, finally, justice. Yes. That's beautiful. Because the mercy and grace is that's, that's what God gives to us. That's it. It's beautiful. It's powerful. That's it. It's powerful. If, if Satan were not to suffer for the sins that he has caused, yes. for the sins he led people to commit, mm -hmm. if he doesn't suffer for it, but Jesus suffers for it, Jesus didn't die right. to take away sins from Satan, to, to, take, to you know, let sins. Satan go free. Our sins. He died, died for, for our, our sins. sins. All right, now, now all those sins belong to me. Now what I'm going to do with those sins? I'm going to put it on him. I already paid it. I died and came back to life. Mm -hmm. Now, Satan, let's see if you can die and come back to life. Mercy. We're going to take these sins and put it on you. Yes. Let's see if you are really God. If you're really God. That's a, shout, that's a shouting moment. If right you there. can come back to yes. life after dying for the sins that have been put on you, then let you be God. And he can't. He can't. And he can't. He can't. He cannot doesn't have that power. He doesn't have that power. Mercy. That's powerful. So let's see. Very if I powerful. could take these sins and bear them, because I'm God, mm -hmm. then you try it now. I'm going to take these sins, put them on you. You're <laughs> going to now bear them. I like, this is funny, Annette, I'm sorry, what Annette said, because I was thinking of all the Brother Sean sayings, but she, <laughs> she, she put a Holy Spirit flag. Holy, Holy, <laughs> Holy Spirit, Spirit flag. Yes, Annette, yes. Okay, go ahead, because yeah. I interrupted that. No, 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 so. That was, that was just so powerful. Yeah. So that's, that's the difference between both goats. Mm -hmm. By the way, mm -hmm. by the way, the fact that the second goat is not killed is basically like Satan saying, nah, I'm not willing to die for you. Mm -hmm. Jesus was willing to die for us. Mm -hmm. He took our sins, was willing to die. Satan's not willing to die for you. Satan's not willing to lay down his life for you. So he's led out into a desolate place where he, where he eventually dies. Yes. But he, he wasn't laying his life down for you. Mm. And when he does die, he can't bring himself back. Because he's not God. No, he's not. He's mercy. Wow. He just ex mercy exposed his weaknesses. Justice. Yeah. Wow. All right. God so it amazing. looks like I may just have to preach a sermon. On yeah, that, I was about to say. That's... I felt like it, it felt like I was in a. I was watching a sermon right here, yeah. <laughs> listening yeah. to a yeah. sermon. Yeah, that that that's powerful. Very powerful. All right, we have another mental health question, um, and you can still put them in the chat. No more Bible questions because he's pretty full, but I can take a few more. I mean, there's still more Bible questions, but. That are coming. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, that yeah. You're going to answer. That I, yeah. Okay. But if you have any mental health questions on mental health or relationships, family, marriage, all of that stuff, you can put it in the chat. All right. Is there a particular diagnosis for when you publicly present a happy, personable, and self-confident personality when you're around most people? But on the inside, you are not, um, and not all the time, but a lot of the time, in the inside, you're fighting the depression and your introvert tendencies and low self-esteem. Um, so first of all, there is high-functioning depression, right? High-functioning depression is you... Um, have a job where you're out, you know, and you have a career where you're in front of people and on the outside, even maybe your family and your friends just see this, uh, you know, confident or just this person that can just be a go-getter and get things done. But on the inside, it's these thoughts and these feelings are just kind of eating 
uh, I don't want to say eating you alive, but they are just really uh, plaguing you. And so that is very possible. I mean, high functioning depression is what this sounds like, but I'm not your therapist or your mental health professional, so I cannot diagnose you with that. And that's not what we're doing here, but just asking educational questions. But um, yes, you can be a high functioning, high functioning depressed person and still be going to work, still be going to school, still being a mother or a father or whatever you have to do in all of these roles. But you're still people see this this front on the outside, but inside you're you're not happy. And so um, my advice and my encouragement to anyone that is struggling in that area is to definitely go talk to a, a mental health counselor, to talk to a therapist, and um, just to you know just to try to, to work th these things out. I mean. Um, a lot of people think that depression only looks like, oh, I can't get out of bed or, oh, I always have a sad face or, you know, that's not always the case. By many me means, it's not always the case. You have millions of high functioning depressed people going, you know, doing all every day, doing these things, going to work, going to school, doing all the things they have to do. But inside, they're very unhappy. And so that's where you and a therapist can sit down and do a lot of work together to find out where this depression is coming from and um, just why you're feeling that way. And, uh, you know, I don't want to go and I don't want to start a therapy session right now, but I'm tempted to want to do that. So definitely reach out to a mental health professional um, to talk about to talk about these things. OK. All right. Uh, so here comes a hot question. Y'all ready? I'm ready. Paul spoke about women oh, in the this, church. This is a hot one. That they should be silent and not speak, as well as how they should dress. Was he sexist? I'm just going to be quiet until you, oh, I'm talking right now. But as I'm in the church, maybe I should just be quiet. Be silent. <laughs> okay. So the text that, um, you know, that is referred to is uh, 1 Corinthians 1433 or 1434. Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. All right. So that's a, you know, that's a, it's a good question. Um, it's a question that is, you know, causes a lot of confusion, I think. Mm -hmm. And so let me start off by saying this. So Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And when you're writing a letter to someone, to a group, you have to take into context what's going on in this church that is leading Paul to write what he's writing. Now, we don't have a whole, you know, we only have Paul's letter. So we can only surmise, guess what may have been happening um, in this church in Corinth. And 1 Corinthians chapter 13, yep, uh, chapter 14, chapter 14, verse 34. I'm sorry, did I say 13? Um, so the entire, cha entire chapter, 1 Corinthians 14, um, they're talking about uh, a bunch of things going on. And it's talking about prophesying and, and in fact, let me just go back up to verse 32. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from verse 32 down to verse 35. Uh, it says the spirits of the prophets are subject to... In fact, let's go back. Let's go back to verse 4. Um, no, I'm just going to go to verse 32. It says, and the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So, you know, they're talking about tongues. They're talking about, you know, don't prophesy out of order. They're talking about... Paul is addressing a whole lot of confusion going on in this particular church. And, and then he goes on to say the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets, verse 32. And then verse 33, he literally says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Now, this word confusion, it literally means tumult. It means sedition there's arguments going on in these church in this in in the church in Corinth 
There's confusion. It's almost like Paul is trying to address a very chaotic situation. Which means then that the men in this church, the women in this church, there's a whole lot of confusion going on. There's a whole lot of arguing. There's a whole lot of dissension happening in the church. So within that context, when Paul writes, for God is not the author of confusion, meaning tumult or sedition, and then he says, let your women keep silence in the church, for it is not per permitted unto them to speak. I am, I am surmising that what Paul is saying here is not women aren't allowed to talk in church, but what he's saying is don't argue in the church. Women, look at what he says in the next verse. Let your women keep silence in the church, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as unto the as also saith the law. And then the very next verse, the very next verse, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. Either Paul is saying women should not speak in the church, or what he's saying is women do not argue in the church. Don't be a part of the argument you see going on. Don't be a part of the confusion. Ask your husbands at home. If we add to this, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, it says, Every man praying or prophesying has having his head covered dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesied with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. So Paul here is now saying, he's just saying, Women are in the church and they're praying and prophesying. All right, so we put these two verses together. We now know, now know Paul is not saying that a woman cannot speak, that a woman cannot prophesy. But what he's saying is d women don't argue in the church, which I think is reasonable, right? Don't argue in the church. First of all, he's saying nobody should be arguing in the, in the church. But apparently in this situation, the men and the women are getting into it. They're arguing over whatever. And Paul is saying, women, talk to your husbands at home. Don't be a part of the argument that's going on in the church. We know he's not saying to women, don't prophesy, because in fact, in the book of Acts, or in the book of Joel, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream, dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. So... There is no command for a woman not to prophesy, not to pray in church. Because God said, I'll pour out my spirit, and this is what your young women will do. Mm -hmm. So I believe that the context is that Paul is speaking to a church that is in much confusion. Mm -hmm. And he's saying to the men, y'all need to stop arguing. To the women, don't, don't be a part of this. Mm -hmm. If you're confused and you got questions and that this is going on, ask, talk to you, do this in your own household. Mm. Um, <clears throat> were there women prophets in the Bible? Yep. Yes. Do we have a woman prophet who preached from the pulpit in our own church? Yes. Yes. And has it written... The most has books, written the most spiritual books, the Guinness yep. books of world record. Yeah, she's written has written most, more most books than spiritual books as spiritual a, books for a woman than it, or just in, in general, just for men or yeah. women. Okay, well, yeah. So, again, when people use this verse to say, Women be quiet, don't speak in the church, don't say anything, you got to deal with verses like First Corinthians chapter 11, where the same author is saying, uh. You know, women, if you prophesy, cover your head, which, again, was a tradition in that time, mm -hmm. uh, not a commandment of the Lord, mm -hmm. right? You're not going to find that in the Bible. Mm -mm. Um, so anyway, uh, context. Context is everything, but it's a good question, and it's good to know. So when you get confronted with something like that, you have a good answer that is pertaining to the context of what the... Yeah of what was really being said at that time. 
but it's so very important to really know. It's a good question mm -hmm. because I'll be honest. I mean, I just, I mean, obviously we, we didn't believe yeah. that to be literal. Or I, would, I would not be sitting here with mm -hmm. you right now and talking, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I just still didn't have the deeper answer it's just like, oh, okay, well, I don't understand that completely, but I know that doesn't mean women can't speak in the church. Yeah. But that's not good enough. That's right. not a good enough answer for someone who is really like, okay, the, the Bible's weird. Why does it say this? Yeah. We need to have answers like that. Yeah. We need and, to have answers like that. And listen, so again, yeah, again, what I'm saying is that we don't have the context of, we don't have the full context of what's going on in the church. All we can do is surmise from the letter. Right. Right? Right. So it appears from this letter that what's going on in this church is people are speaking out of order. People, there is no order going on in the church. And now Paul begins to address it. And there appears to be an issue with the women in this church who are also doing things and being part of this debating spirit. And Paul is like, you know, same Paul is like, mm -hmm. women should be shamefaced, meek, humble. And that's what he's saying, mm -hmm. right? So it's mm -hmm. not a sexist thing No. in a sense of, you know, Y'all are second-class citizens. Y'all don't know anything. He's basically telling them both to stop. He was telling can, them both to stop. Can y'all stop? I don't know why he broke it into like women yeah. and men, or maybe he, I don't know why. <laughs> but so the Bible talks about Paul writing a lot of things that are hard to be understood, mm -hmm. uh, and and people take his writings out of context. Okay. And this is one of those examples. So again, um, just know the same Paul says when women when women prophesy. Let them have their heads covered. Right. So he's not saying women don't speak. And think about Priscilla. So they, right? Yeah. I have something to say. But <laughs> maybe Paul didn't always know how to speak to women per se. I'm just saying that because he was not married. <laughs> Paul was all about the gospel and was not married. So he didn't, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just, this is just me being a therapist. But, you know, maybe he just didn't know how to, maybe he could, I mean, I definitely feel like so, he could have worded it different. Doesn't make it wrong what he's saying or it wasn't inspired by God. I'm not saying any of that. I'm just saying maybe he could have just, and again, maybe the translation is a little, I don't know. Uh, I don't, yeah. I've never studied Greek and Hebrew. I yeah. have no idea how it actually reads. So context yeah, I get the context. Right? And even context and how people spoke in those days. Right, I was about to you say, know, maybe it's just this day. I, Jesus. You wouldn't say it like that today. Jesus. Woman? Yeah, you wouldn't say uh, that like that. You know, mm -hmm. when we hear Jesus talk to his mother and he says, woman, my time has not yet come, we're like... That sounds a little... It sounds, yeah. What? what? Yeah. Jeez, did you just call... Did you just say to your mother, woman? Can you imagine you telling your mom that? Yeah. yeah no, now, if I, I say to my day, <laughs> to my mom, woman... <laughs> no. I'm not. I can't even I come all the way from Huntsville. Can I can I get some food? <laughs> <laughs> you would never have to say that because your mom always has to be yeah. ready when we walk in the door. Yeah. So you wouldn't have to. Say so that. what we might think, oh, that that sounds rude. That sounds like derogatory. The way people spoke in those times is going to be different from the way that we speak in our times. So context. Right. Context. Context. OK. I, should I? Try to knock out these other questions. They're not going to be as long. They're not long? Okay. Do you want to? Well, uh, okay. I could, mine aren't long either. Go ahead. And I'm going to, my next round, I'm just going to try to do all these questions because they're going to be quick answers. Okay. And then, then I can do it. Okay. I'm, yeah. So there's, there was one that came in that was like, is there just, um, are there just, uh, the question was, and you guys probably saw it because it's in the chat, is there toxic, People are toxic behavior. So this is an easy answer. There's toxic behavior. I mean, and, and, you know, people are, that's their behavior. So you feel like it's them. So, but behaviors can change. Um, so your, your thoughts can change, your feelings change, your behaviors change. And so people are not just born toxic. Okay. So it's the behavior that's toxic and praise God that behavior can change because of neuroplasticity. Our minds can change, our behaviors can change. Um, and so that is possible. Um, but if you're in a situation in a relationship with a toxic person, it's always wise to set boundaries and protect yourself. So, that, so that's a quick, that's a quick answer to that one. Um, okay. So the next question is, how do you support a loved one that is going through depression? Um, good question. Good question. Cause, um, it is, 
It is difficult and challenging. The number one is to remember that you're not a mental health professional, right? So what you can do for, and I say that to say, um, doesn't mean you can't give inv- advice or th- things, but I would definitely um, try to stay away from telling them what they should do and all of these things because, you know, mental health professionals are trained to be able to help someone who's dealing with mental health issues like depression, anxiety, and other uh, issues in a way that um, is, is going to um, take them step by step and uh, you know, and hopefully um, have them gaining ground without losing them, if you will. I mean, you could say the wrong thing and they're going to shut the door to you altogether. And then that depression can go very far and they might have some self-harm ideation, like, all those things. So you just don't want that door to close is what I'm trying to say. So what you can do is to show them love, show them true empathy. And as we've shared here before, empathy and sympathy are different. Empathy is like, I will just sit here. I will just sit here with you. I can cry here with you. I will just show you how much I may not understand every single thing that you're feeling and thinking, but I love you. So I feel pain when you feel pain. And so that, that, that loved one or that friend that is just going to show them empathy, maybe even ask them. Um, and if you have that close relationship with them, of course you can encourage them in a soft, subtle way to be like, you know, there's, there's people that you can talk to about this. There's, you know, I can, you can, um, however they may need assistance in getting to a mental health therapist or whatever, you can, you know, say, Hey, if they need a ride or whatever, you know, say, I can help you get there. I can, I can help you in any other way. If maybe they have young children and they might need a babysitter, say, Hey, I will babysit your children so you can go to your therapist appointment or whatever it is, but you're showing empathy and trying to help them in any way that you can without being too much. You just want to be there with them and they know that you're there so that when they need to call out or say, hey, can you help me in this area? You're there. You're there for them. Um, So love and empathy and making yourself available to help them. All right. Okay. Amen. All right. Um, so this one is uh, a question regarding Judges 19.26 to the end of the chapter. Uh, here's what it says. Uh, the question is, doesn't give names. Did this really happen? What is the meaning behind this? This story is hard to take. So here's the story. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the door of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman his concubine had fallen down at the door of his house and her hands were upon the threshold. Uh, And he said unto her, up, let us be going. But none answered. Then the man took her up up, upon the ass and the man rose up and got him to his place. And then the rest of the story goes, she dies. He cuts her in pieces and Mm -hmm. sends her body parts to Israel. She had been raped the night before by a whole crowd of of, of men. this story is in the Bible. Yeah. And he sends the pieces to all of Israel, and Israel, you know, gets, uh, they're like, what in the world is this? And then this turns out to be a civil war within Israel, I think with the tribe of Benjamin, who was protecting this man and wouldn't give him up. Hmm. It's a confusing story. Yes. But I think the answer to, you know, why is this in the Bible and what does it have to do with anything? is actually located in a verse that is before this chapter and a verse that is after this chapter. So the first thing I want you to note is that the account happens in the book of Judges. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. It's happening in the book of Judges. And number two, in Judges chapter 17, verse 6, and Judges chapter 21, verse 25, these verses are repeated. This verse is repeated. So remember, Judges 17, this verse... Judges 19, the story, Judges 21, this same verse. Here's what it says. In those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Um, what was Satan's argument in heaven? His argument was, 
we should be able to do what is right in our own eyes. Angels should be free to choose right and wrong for themselves. They can determine what is right and wrong for themselves. Adam and Eve, you can be like God, knowing good and evil for yourself. Just do what is right in your own eyes. What's happening here in the book of Judges is that Israel is in a time period where everybody is doing what is right in their own eyes. And you know what happens when you do, when you have a society that does what is right in their own eyes? This, what we just read. Yeah, that's a crazy story. This is what happens when you accept Satan's principle over God's principle right? Remember, it's in the book of Judges. Remember that there is a judgment in which we can either follow the will and the law of God or claim that we can do what is right in our own eyes. And I think what this story is illustrating more than anything is that this is the result of people who think they don't need God they can do what is right in their own eyes. Eventually, it's going to devolve into chaos. Hmm. So that would be my understanding and my preaching of this, of this particular passage, right? Okay. This is what happens, total anarchy. This is what happens when every man does what is right in his own eyes. Mm -hmm. This is what happens when people choose to say, I can know the, the difference between good and evil for myself. Right. I don't need the law of God. I don't need the king of Israel to help me determine what is right and what is wrong. Okay. So, um, hopefully that answer helps you. Question number two. At the second coming, when Jesus comes, will God the Father come with him? I'll read two verses, Matthew 8, 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and, and, and of my words in this adulterous and sinful, sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Mm -hmm. And again, Luke 9, 26, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Which says to me that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Angels will all be there mm -hmm. at the second coming. All right. Last question? Yes. I got one more and then, okay. No, I don't have any more. Okay. So this is your la this okay. is the last question. Last question. I'll try to make this one very quick. Uh, hello, here's my Bible question. In Proverbs 20, 27, it says, The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all his in innermost parts. I know that the spirit can equate with breath, but in this verse, I don't think it would necessarily make sense. Some people take the spirit of man to mean that man has a spirit in him that goes to heaven at death. And if I tell them that what goes back to death, to God at death, is the breath of life uh, that he gave us, they will use this verse and 1 Corinthians 2.11 to show that breath makes no sense here. Is the spirit of man referring to the, is referencing the Holy Spirit's work in man? So the text in 1 Corinthians 2.10 and 11 um, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So I'm just going to give this uh, uh, answer uh, in, in a, hopefully a, a speedy way. So yes, the spirit can be a reference to the breath, but it is also a reference to the mind, which again is the living being, is the living person, right? You, you are not you without your mind. When man became a living soul, he became a living, a living being. And the spirit, yes, in a technical sense, it is a breath. But it also is a, is a word that is used to represent the mind, the thinking man, right? The living man. It's still not a separate entity. It's just, it, it, is, it can be interchanged with the word soul. For example, Job chapter 7, verse 11. Therefore will I not refrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Job is here using the words spirit and soul interchangeably. Isaiah 26, 9. 
When my soul, with my soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. He's using the words interchangeably. It still doesn't mean a separate entity than the actual being. It is who you are. Mm -hmm. You are the soul. You are the spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Same soul, spirit, the same thing, a living being. So um, in short, no, the spirit is not a separate entity that thinks on its own outside of your body. It thinks inside your body as you are connected to your body. Mm -hmm. um, it is in used interchangeably with the soul or the person himself. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. That's it. I just a real quick question came in. Yeah. It's a really Go easy ahead. one. Mm -hmm. It just says, um, when you speak of reference to a mental health professional, um, who am I specifically talking about? So, the, yes. So I'm talking about a licensed mental health professional. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. There's licensed um, professional counselors. There's uh, clinical licensed social workers who also give counseling. Um, and so that is who I'm talking about, a licensed mental health professional, a therapist, um, and there's so many out there. So if, if, you're, if you're experiencing anything um, that is causing you to, to not feel um, the way that you should be feeling, whether it's through depression or anxiety or even in a marriage situation, and you they feel like you guys need some therapy, some couples counseling or a family situation, Definitely reach out to a mental health professional in your area. Um, it will, it can really make a difference um, in your situation. Um, we know that we always have God, and it's a blessing. And God has trained human beings on this earth that can also help to um, to work through things and have a perspective change. So, uh, encourage anyone who is who is struggling to definitely reach out to a mental health professional. And yeah, those were some heavy duty Bible questions, but you did well <laughs> and gave, and I learned a lot too, um, and some perspective change as well. So hopefully it was a blessing to you guys. Uh, we love freestyle Sabbath schools or question and answer. Mm -hmm. Can't really call them all the way freestyle, but question and answer. Um, so uh, definitely, hey, when you have these questions, you can send them in. If you emailed them, emailed them in. So you could always email them to Atante at Living Mana. Uh, dot church and we will just keep collecting them um, because we do this at least once a month so definitely want you guys to to tune in for that we want to pray to end this section and then we have uh, some membership um, transfers and so we want to get to those as well okay let's pray heavenly father we thank you for giving us this opportunity to fellowship together uh, we ask lord that um the answers that were given Lord, will be a blessing to those that that uh, were watching that will watch and uh, Lord, we just thank you for your love for us. We thank you again, Lord, um, for uh, coming into this world to die on our behalf, Lord, that we might have everlasting life. And so, um, Lord, continue to bless us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, just to let you guys know that if you have been watching and, and you're a and you have been loving what Living Man at Church does, you can become a member of this Living Man at Church. Um, and so we just want to put up that information for you now, how you can do that. You can simply send an email to patrice at livingmana.live, uh, and she will start the ball rolling for a membership transfer. If you would like to join, be an official member of Living Man at Church. We love our viewing uh, viewing audience who are like members as well. Uh, but if you want to become an official member, that is how you can do that. Um, so we want to, we have, let's see, we have a few here that we have a couple, Heather Adams and Jacob Adams, who are going to be transferring out of Living Managed Church to the Hemet Seven-day Adventist Church. And this is the first reading for them. And Heather and J Jacob, we have known you since California, the California days. So uh, you will be missed here at Living Managed Church, but you can always come back and can always view and watch with us. Um, and then we have Shadena Jackson uh, going to the Houston Northwest Seven-day Adventist Church. 
and then Sandy Maupin going to Victory Seven Day Adventist Church. And that's the first reading for them. Now we have two that are coming into Living Man of Church. That is Jamie Abel, and that's from uh, the Tamarin Adventist, uh, I'm sorry, Tamarin Avenue Seven Day Adventist Church. And then we have Artel Francis Peter coming from the Berean Seven Day Adventist Church in Atlanta. So we are excited for those of you who are wanting to become and to be a part of this Living Man of Church. This church has been a blessing to, to both of us. It's been a huge blessing to, uh, to be a part of the leadership here at Living Man of Church. We pray that it will continue to be a blessing for all of you that want to become official members. And hopefully you're in a small group, but if you're not, check out the small groups uh, on Mighty Networks because there's a small group for everyone, yep. a small group for everyone. And that's where we form community. And we are just excited to have people that want to be a part of this church and to be a part of the growth. We are celebrating our second uh, anniversary, two years of being, in, of being a church. And so we are just happy to have you all that want to want to join the church. But we will um, talk about the member transfer, the way you do that again in the divine worship. So we just want to thank you guys for being here with us. Continue to worship with us because there are many more blessings still to come as we worship together on this Sabbath day. It's common knowledge. Sharks are terrifying monsters of the deep that love to hunt humans for lunch. Anytime you see a shark, you should get away as fast as possible, right? But what if everything you thought you knew about sharks was wrong? What if reality was far different from our pre-programmed perceptions? Well, this week, we're going diving with one of the most feared sharks in all of the ocean to find out firsthand what they're actually like, the traumatic and terrorizing tiger shark. Throughout history, people have always been afraid of sharks. Jaws was the movie that did it for me. I remember seeing it as a child and being terrorized. Sharks have been attacked in movies and in media as mindless monsters that want to destroy you. And this perception has caused people to attack sharks at the death rate of over 100 million per year. And growing up in the waters of Hawaii, this is what I always believed to be true. That sharks are monsters, they will eat you. And so from a child, sharks have always been my greatest fear. The reality, however, is much different. Despite millions of people swimming in waters where sharks are present, only an average of five people per year will die from a shark attack. Now let's put that into perspective. 200 people die each year from elephants, 150 from falling coconuts on their head, 50 from lightning strikes, 15 from falling icicles, and 12 from high school and college football. You see, friends, the reality is this. We are often terrified of things unnecessarily. Popular opinions are believed over the raw evidence and nothing will persuade us otherwise. We blindly hang on to our fear and let it tear away at our minds without ever confronting it. And so this week, I'm facing my childhood fear to rediscover for myself what these wild animals are actually like. Despite their reputation of being mindless, man-eating monsters, tiger sharks are actually very shy, slow, and cautious creatures. While considered one of the top apex predators of the sea, tiger sharks are mostly scavengers, usually settling to eat the dead, the dying, the sickly, the weak, and the injured. They serve as the white blood cells of the sea, keeping the ocean clean, healthy, and balanced. Now, I'm not a marine biologist or a shark expert by any means, but I've had the privilege of shark diving with some of the best marine biologists and shark conservationists in the world. And I've learned that sharks are grossly misunderstood. While we're to have a healthy respect for these apex predators, we don't have to have a blind fear towards them. The professionals have opened my eyes to see sharks for what they really are. They taught me how to read their body language, when it's safe to enter into the waters with them, and how to swim and interact with these silent hunters of the deep. Shark diving should never be done without professional supervision. And having my own personal encounter with the tigers, the bulls, hammerheads, and even the great whites in this context 
has been one of the most incredible experiences of my life. And from being my greatest fear, sharks have now become my greatest fascination. Understanding their true nature and just how important they are to the ocean compels me to do whatever I can to protect them and educate others about them. You see, in life, we're often fearful of things that we don't understand. People tell us that we should fear something, and so we do. Now, please don't misunderstand. Not all fear is bad, but fear that is misdirected can lead to devastating consequences. And this blind fear is unhealthy. And wouldn't it be good if we could be freed from all the unhealthy fears that hold us back in life? You know, of all the fears today, perhaps the biggest fear for most is the fear and the resulting avoidance of God. Many have been told since childhood that God is fierce, frightening, or fictitious. In fact, society tells us that to believe in God is opposed to being intellectual. Just like sharks, the idea of God is being attacked. God's character is attacked as being brutal, unfeeling, uncaring, and unreal. But what if just like the sharks, God was being mislabeled? Today, people kill over 100 million beautiful sharks each year due to fear and misunderstanding, thereby destroying this beautiful world. But what if our fear and misunderstanding of God was causing us to make similar decisions that are disastrous, not only for our lives, but also in the lives of those around us? Sharks are incredible creatures. They are truly magnificent guardians of the deep. But God is even more incredible. And correctly understood, we will see that there is no one better and there is none like Him. And just like accurate information and first-hand experience dispels the many myths about sharks, it is these same things that dispel the myriad of myths about God. And so, I invite you to come to God's Word, the Bible, to see God for who He really is, not what others have said about Him, but rather what He has said and revealed about Himself. Go ahead and take the plunge. Go deeper, beneath the surface of mere theorizing and speculation. Prove the promises of the Lord. Experience Him firsthand for yourself. And I promise you, if you come with an open mind and a searching heart, honestly desiring to know the truth, you will find it. And you will discover that nothing on this green earth or in the deep blue sea can compare with knowing the truth of the wise, the beautiful, almighty. We hope you've been blessed and inspired by this new Reflections of Hope episode. This episode is one of many that's been produced all over the world. If you haven't done so yet, please give our video a like, share it with your friends, and please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. If you'd like to see more inspiring episodes and get access to much more uplifting content, please go now to patreon.com forward slash revelation of hope and sign up to be a member of our Patreon page. Your monthly support will not only give you early access to many more inspiring videos, but it will also enable us to continue to produce more of these cinematic object lessons from nature. Our goal is to produce and release these episodes much more frequently. So please prayerfully consider partnering with us so that we may continue to share the hope of Jesus all over the world. Thank you so much for your support. Aloha and Maranatha.
Harvest Church family. I'm so happy that you decided to stay with us and to continue to worship with us today. We are just so thankful for each and every one of you. As always, please put in the chat where you're viewing from. If you've already done that during our first service, you don't have to do it again. But if you're just joining us for the Divine Worship uh, service now, please put in the chat where you are viewing from so we can just say a welcome to you and let everyone know where you're viewing from. And if this is your first time, please put a one in the chat because again, we wanna say a very special welcome to you and welcome you to Liberty Manor Church for the very first time. You know, this is the time, and I know some of you that, um, have, that, are, that worship with us week after week, you already know, but you can put in the chat uh, your prayer request at this time. And so our prayer leader, Brother Terry, um, and his wife uh, will be reading the testimonies, but he will be praying over your prayer request. So if you have a special prayer request, please put it in the chat at this time, and Brother Terry will be praying over those requests. We are so thankful to have a prayer team uh, that is just so faithful that prays over your requests every day. Um, there's, all, there's always prayer over these requests. It's not just today on Sabbath. They are praying. No prayer request that is sent in to Living Manage Church uh, gets missed out. They all get prayed over. So we want you to put in a prayer request if you have one uh, so our prayer team can pray for you. Just want to say welcome. Some of these, um, I see that we have Spokane, Tacoma, and, and Spokane, Washington. I didn't catch the name. It went up too fast, so I apologize for that. We have Trevor from Idaho. Trevor, it's always a blessing to see you here. We're so thankful that you are here with us, and we know that you are a very special friend to our dear brother, Sean Cox. So happy Sabbath. Glad to see you here. Going to see, I know I missed some. We got Mrs. Edwards from Mississippi. Welcome. Welcome. And that was to you, Ross. That's the person I missed from, from Spokane uh, in Tacoma, Washington. So good to see you. We have Opal from viewing from Jamaica. Welcome. Good to see you here. Always good to have all of our uh, viewing audience from all around the world. During our first service, I did see Sydney, Australia, but we were in the middle of answering questions. So I just want to say a special welcome to you, uh, to our friends there in Sydney, Australia. We have Irene um, visiting, let's see, are watching from Ethiopia. Welcome. Thank you for being. Um, okay, and you put a one. So, Irene, thank you for being here at Living Manor Church. This is your first time. We are very happy to have you here with us. Uh, just to let you know, and I'll give you some more information about that, but you're definitely going to want to sign up to get information from us or join. And you're about to hear more information about this, but you're going to want to get information and alerts so you can know when we're going live and our programming. So we have mental health programming and we have mental health Mondays. We have that programming where we talk about mental health issues. I host that along with uh, my co-host, Dr. Ricardo White, who's a psychiatrist. Then we have True Health Tuesdays, where we're talking about health uh, topics um, and issues by two amazing doctors. Uh, we have a licensed naturopathic doctor and a medical doctor, and they are both amazing, Dr. Kanisha Reynolds and Dr. Roger Schwelt. And then on Wednesdays, we have our prayer service. So if you're wanting to be a part of any of that, uh, when I mention that the way that you can sign up, you're going to want to do that. I don't know if I missed any other ones, but um, I know that uh, everyone is, is just um, putting in where they are viewing from. And so we have Felix from Canada. Welcome. So glad that you are here with us, Felix. We love, uh, love our Canadian uh, membership and our viewership because they are they are always here and we're just thankful to everyone who views from all around the world so I might as well let you guys know now how you can stay connected to Living Manna Church if you are here in the United States you are going to want to sign up to get text messages from Living Manna Church this is how uh, we can send announcements in the middle of the week, or we can send important information that you're going to need to know that's of a timely uh, fashion. And so the way you can do that is you can sign up by dialing or, or, or texting LMOC to 
877-207-4107. And again, that's 855-207-4107 and text LMOC and that will automatically sign you up to get teched. You can actually scan that QR code as well. Now, if you're not in the United States, if you're not in the United States, you need to sign up for Mighty Networks. Now, you're going to want to sign up for Mighty Networks anyways, because that is our, we are a church without walls. Brother Sean loved to say that, church without walls. We are a church without walls, but we're not a church with, with we're not a church that doesn't have a home. We do have a home. It's a virtual home and it's Mighty Networks. And so Mighty Networks is our virtual church building. And that is where you will learn about all the many small groups that Living Man and Church has going on. And you can join those small groups. That's where we give announcements. So the announcements that, you, that people will get in a text, they will also be on Mighty Networks. And if you're not in the country, you can get those announcements on Mighty Networks. And the link to sign up for Mighty Networks is going to go up in the chat so that you will be able to sign up for that. Because again, that is our virtual church home. That's where we form community. There's prayer walls there. So uh, we have a prayer team and you can, you're gonna, I'm gonna tell you soon how you can email prayer requests to our prayer team, but there's also prayer walls there. You can post your prayer requests there. It is our church home. And so if you love everything that's going on at Living Man of Church and you wanna stay connected with Living Man of Church, and continue to build that community um, and, and just friendships and, and spiritual relationships in uh, at Living Matter Church, you're gonna wanna go to Mighty Networks where that, again, is our virtual church home. I wanna also remind everyone that we do have LMOC Kids and LMOC Kids is going strong and we have that each and every week. So if you um, want your kids to be a part of LMOC Kids, um, it's every Saturday morning, every Sabbath morning, but you at 1130 Central Time. But if you want your child to be a part of LMOC Kids, you can text KIDS to 855-207-4107 or you can email LMOC Kids at livingmana.church and the leadership will get that email and they will get back to you letting you know exactly how your uh, child can get involved and be there and, it, and just so that your children can get the spiritual blessing that Living Mana Church has to offer. And again, we're just so thankful that we have children's programming and children leadership here uh, at Living Mana Church because it's so very important to reach our young people at a very young age and get them excited to want to learn and study uh, the Word of God at a very young age. And so we're thankful for the team that leads LMOC Kids. I mentioned the prayer team and sending prayer requests, but I want you to be able to have that email um, so that you can be able to do that. And this same email that you're gonna get, this is where you can send your request, but then this is also where you're gonna send your testimony. When God answers the prayer, you'll be able to send your testimony there. So you see the email there, you can send it to pray at livingmana.church. As I mentioned earlier, you can be on Mighty Networks and you can write your prayer request on the prayer wall, or you can text pray to that 855 207-4107 number and the prayer team will get that. So that is the way that you can send in prayer requests so that if it's not Sabbath and something happens during the week and you're like, hey, I need Living Matter Church prayer team to pray about this, you can email them and they will get that. They also have a 24 hour prayer chain as well. So if you want this prayer request to go on the 24 hour, you can send it to that same email address and then um, in the, the subject bar, you can put 24 hour prayer needed. I also wanna let you guys remind you that there is a baptismal class going on and we're gonna be having some baptiz baptisms coming up really soon. And so Pastor Myers does lead out in this baptismal class. And if you are interested, if you are interested in wanting to get baptized, if you feel like God is calling you to be baptized, then you, you wanna be um, a part of this class so you can learn more about what the Seventh-day Adventist Church believes. Um, if you're even getting re-baptized, you can, you can come to this class. And so they meet on Thursdays 
every Thursday at 7.30 uh, p.m. Central Time. And you can also text BAPTIZE to that 855-207-4107 number, or you can email, as you can see there, at BibleWorker at church. So that's how you can become to become a part of that baptismal class. So a new program he has started, and that's with Loami Richardson, and it is called The Struggle is Real. The Struggle is Real. And um, Brother Loami is such a blessing, and I know that he's so um, just so transparent and just right on everyone's level. Like he's never going to be talking over your head, and I know that you will be able to relate to any all the information that he is sharing um, during uh, this this class that he is giving, and it is called the Struggle Is Real, and that's on Thursdays. Um, that's Thursday, April twenty fifth at seven p.m. And so you're going to want to be uh, a part of that. And that is on Altar Live. So you're going to want to see that on Altar Live Thursdays, and that this Thursday, April 25th at 7 p.m. I just love Living Man of Church so much because we don't, we, we have, like when I said there's a small group for everyone, I really mean that. There is a small group for everyone. If you are, you or a friend or a family member is dealing with, addiction recovery and would like some support in that area or to be a part of a small group that is dealing with that topic we have that we have that and um it's called it's star star is steps uh to um recovery steps to recovery and you can see that gina brower um is one that leads out in that and that is on altar live every thursday at 7 p.m central time and so if that um, interests you definitely check that out because that is a blessing uh, to be able to have a, a church community that is dealing with such practical topics that are going on um, in so many people's lives um, and so definitely want to check out star that's a small group and you can learn more about it on mighty networks but it's thursday at 7 p.m. Central Time on Altar Live. And so again, we're just so blessed to have uh, volunteer leadership that is willing to lead small groups that are covering topics like this. Um, we also, we have, we have a men's ministry, men's ministry. And again, I, I don't know the statistics right off of my head, but we know more women are in church than men, right? We know that it doesn't matter what denomination across the board. And so it's so important to have uh, a men's ministry that is really dealing with real issues that helps to uh, just strengthen our men spiritually and for them to just know that they are loved and cherished and that they're so very important to the family unit and to the church and so we have a men's ministry uh, that by god's grace brings um our, just brings so many so much blessing to the men that are part of that ministry so as you can see there uh it's seven loaves or seven loaves and fishers of men that's tuesdays at 7 30 central time that's the men's ministry so you can text men to that uh, 855 number and you can get more information but you can also learn more about the men's ministry and every other small group on alt i'm sorry not on altar live but on mighty networks on mighty networks so you're going to want to check that out um, so that is just a few i'm just highlighting a few of our small ministries this church is a busy church like i said we have something for everyone and we we praise God for that. We praise God for the volunteers and those who are so committed to making this church be the church that God wants it to be. And I say it just like that. This is God's church and this it's going in the direction that he wants it to go, go through or go to and no one or no thing can stop it. Satan can't stop God's church. He tries to, if he wants to try to stop God's things, he tries to get in, into people to try to mess things up but he is not powerful enough. And so we praise God that he is more powerful and this is his church. He is leading it. He is guiding it. Um, and it will continue to go into all the world 
for as long as God wants it to go into all the world. And we believe that until Jesus comes. And so we just praise God uh, for the Living Matter Church. Again, we're celebrating our second anniversary. So we are just just thrilled about that and that God has brought it so far. And just, you know what, if you go back to the very beginning, go look at our old, old videos, like from year one and the first few months or the first six months, you will see a huge difference in change. Just at Living Man Church has just grown. It's just growing up. Just like a child grows up, it was a baby then. Um, and, and it just grows up and it's just learning more about the technology and the look and everything. And you have helped to do that because of your faithfulness and giving through your prayers, through your financial gifts to Living Man and Church, that helps us to be able to continue to grow and to get better and continue to go into all the world. And so we thank you so very much for all of your prayers, your financial support, you being here each and every week, you sharing the links and telling people about the church and inviting people to church. It's all because of you and God. So we all participate in the success of this first online Seventh-day Adventist church. It's all of us together. We're doing this together. And so we just say thank you to all of you. Just want to let you know that you can continue, how you can continue to give. And we have a little side note today. Many of you probably got the text. That's why it's important to sign up for the text, because it's really important when we have information uh, to share with you guys. So currently, right now, we're not accepting cash app if you want to give your tithe and offering through Cash App, the church is not able to accept that at this time. When that changes, if that changes, but when that changes and if that changes, we will definitely communicate that to you and let you know. Um, and so the only way that you can give online right now is through AdventistGiving.org. Um, and we're going to get that slide up here so that you can see if you're not, if you guys, if you have never used AdventistGiving.org, it's, it's a virtual tithe envelope, so you go to AdventistGiving.org, you put in Living Man at Church, you click to the right, and you will have a virtual tithe envelope fall down. And it looks just like a tithe envelope that's in the back of a pew at a brick and mortar church. And you will be able to give your tithe, your local church offering, the benevolence fund, there's a student um, student fun to help students that are in college and in and, and school that need some assistance. There's so many different things that you'll be able to give there. And so if you're wanting to give online, uh, which most of you do because we're not in a brick and mortar church, you have to go to AdventistGiving.org. So I'm just going to leave that up there for a little bit. want that slide to be up there for a little bit longer than normal just because it's new because we don't have Cash App at this current time. And I want to say this too, if you have given to Cash App in the last two days, it's your funds that you want to give to the church, they're still sitting there in Cash App. They haven't come over to us. And so you can cancel that and then reissue those funds, take it, it'll go back to your bank and then you can reissue those funds and send it to AdventistGiving.org uh, if you would like to. So just to let everyone know that any Cash App payments that were given in, in the last two days, has, is not going, has not come to Living Man at Church because we are not uh, connected to that system at this very time. But when that changes, we will let you know. The other way to give, if you um, don't want to give online, is you can still mail it in. You can mail, uh, there's the address there. It is P.O. Box 428 Owens Crossroads, Alabama 35763. Just write it, of course, write your check out to Living Man at Church. Put, a, put in a little note saying this much is for tithe, this much is for offering or to whatever, um, whatever you want to give to. So again, if it's the Benevolence Fund, it's for, if it's for the students, if it's for, you know, Adra, whatever it is, just put on that, on that note and we will make sure that it goes to the right place. So again, we're just so thankful for all of you, for all your the giving that you have given in the last two years uh, financially, your time, all the volunteers that give their time to this church and their talent to this church. We really are blessed. We really, really are blessed. And so uh, we just say thank you. We just say thank you to all of our viewing audience. Again, all of our volunteers, 
we are just beyond blessed here at Living Man Church. And so we is our goal to continue to provide Christ-centered biblical programming that is going to bless your life and help you and get the word out to your friends and family that it'll interest them to want to know who Jesus is and want to get more deeper into the Bible and change their life. And so this is our, we are just following the mission that God has given to all of us to go into all the world. And because of this technology, we are going into all of the world. And thank you for supporting this mission. If you would just bow your heads with me as we pray and just thank God for all of his many blessings and just remind ourselves, like my t-shirt says, God is good all the time. He's always good. He loves us, each and every one of us, and he is there for us. Even in those difficult times, God is still there. He has the true empathy for all of us. He will never, ever leave us, even in those hard times. So let's just thank him and praise him for being that good, good God all the time. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for this church. I thank you for all of our members and our viewing audience. Lord, I thank you just for all the blessings that you have poured out upon this church, Lord. The volunteers are absolutely amazing, Lord. Their commitment to this church is like I've never seen it on this level. And we just praise you, Lord. We just praise you. They're all around the world. They're all around the country but it's everyone who is committed to Living Man Church that makes this church work. And we just praise you because you put that fire and passion in their heart to want to support this church. And so, Lord, you deserve all the praise and all, just all the praise, Lord. And Lord, we want to remember that our dear sister Crystal and the Cox family is just, they're grieving, Lord. They have lost their father, the husband, the brother, and Lord, we've lost a dear member of this church, but Lord, I just pray that you will comfort them, give them peace, help them to help them to even rise above the pain in a way that you help them to be able to be okay on a daily basis, to function on a daily basis. Even they will always have their dear husband and father and brother in their heart, Lord. That, Death can't take that away. Death can't take away the memories, the special moments. It doesn't do that, Lord. We always will have that. They will always have that. We all always have those memories. And so, Lord, we thank you that we are able to hold on to memories even when our loved ones um, are gone. And, Lord, we have faith. I personally have faith and know that Sean will be saved and will be in the kingdom, Lord. And I know that we will see him again. So, Lord, I just pray that we will, we here on this earth that are still here, that we will live our life in a way according to your will so that we may be able to be there to see him and you, God, in the kingdom. We look forward to that day. Lord, I pray for Pastor Myers. I pray for the message. I pray that it will touch hearts and lives in a special way that they will leave this church service today changed people, that we will all be changed, that we will be closer to you and more connected to you. We ask all these things in your precious name. Amen.
there's a process that happens in your church. Our faith is like Sleeping Beauty awaiting the kiss of divine love. Dwell in heavenly places. Dwell upon things that are above. Hey, it's Amijah. Happy second anniversary. And thank you for the love, support, and prayers. And please keep playing for my mom. Thank y'all. Hi, it's Aquavis. I just wanted to tell y'all happy second anniversary. I appreciate the love and the support and the prayers. I really need that in my life. And I want to say I enjoy and love Bible class with Pastor Yoda Reed. Hi, Living Manor family. This is Lynette. I am one of the prayer team members for those of you who don't know me. Um, I attend the parent pack and I also attend the midday prayer call for Living Manor's prayer warriors. This has become such a part of my life and it's something that I do look forward to. The parent pack helps me to keep focused on praying for children, praying for families. If we didn't have these events to attend, we could definitely have something else to do, but it's such a blessing to be able to meet with others and to pray and to give God praise and all the glory. So I'm very grateful for the innovation and the vision of Pastor. So have a blessed day, everybody. Here at Living Mana, we bear each other's burdens. When you need support or prayer, when you're feeling discouraged or alone or anxious, you don't have to face life struggles alone. Amen, amen. Happy Sabbath, the living man of family. So good to be with you again today for prayer and praise here with my lovely bride, Amra. And as always, we give God honor and praise for being able to serve you in this capacity. I mean, First Lady says she loves living man. We do too. We love everything about living man. Mm -hmm. We're doing something all the time. I was we're just looking at the memories go up. So many beautiful and incredible memories. But look, I want to I want to take time and do some shout outs real quick. Uh, you know, during question and answer, I was actually on the phone with Brother Earl and, I, and, and, and Earl's one of those people, you know, you get on the phone with you're going to be going to be stuck on the phone. Right. So I wanted to send a special shout out, Brother Earl. Man, we was praying for you this morning. We were praying in the pre huddle and we love you, brother. And it's such a blessing to hear from you today to learn that you're doing well. Uh, you're in a, a rehab center for the next 30 days. 
which is really comfortable. I, I made sure to ask you, you comfortable doing all right? Got visitors today from family. Praise God for that. Phone charger and everything going on good, brother. And um, it was just a, a blessing. And so I want to tell everybody, Brother Earl sends his love. Thank you for your prayers. Specifically, First Lady, Brother Earl says thank you for praying for him and remembering him. And so just want to lift up all that today and let everybody know, hey, we love y'all and thank God for you. And Brother Earl, oh, wow, what a blessing to hear that you are doing well, my man. Um, I also want to send a special shout out here to, um, did we lose, did they lose us? What just happened? I think that we just lost everything. Okay, you can still hear me, but can you see me? Can can everyone see me? Because I just we lost our entire monitor just now. Lord Jesus. Okay, saints, hold on just one second. We seem to have lost our monitor. Okay, you can hear me, but can you see me? Can anyone see me? No picture. Okay. Okay. Well, this going to be one of them faith moves today, I think, because look at the Lord. Okay. And we're back. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> y'all can't see. All right. Little brother, brother Terry got a few little drops of sweat here on his forehead. All right. Look, don't ever let him see you sweat, saints. Look. We just don't like any trouble, but that's all right. God will help us to navigate through it. I was just talking to the, the first lady this morning. We are spiritual stormtroopers, saints. We are. We either in the middle of a storm or we're coming out one storm heading into another. But we are built for battle and we are made for victory. Can we say amen? Amen. Amen. All right. All right. I'm almost scared to move over here now, but but you, <laughs> hey, don't live scared, saints. <laughs> Amen. Okay, I'm back. I see you. If we back, everybody say amen. We go, we we got to do these praise reports and, and we got to get in prayer. Yeah, that's right. I see you. I see you. That's right. Get behind us, Satan. I see you, Christy. Look, I'm going to do these shout outs. Sister Charlotte came through surgery. We love you. Sending prayers and blessings to you. We want to send a special shout out to our newest leader of the prayer team. That's Sister Valerie. And that's the devil's hot about that because Sister Valerie has a special gift and we're working on how we can use that. We're listening to God. God, show us how we can use this special gift to uh, advance the kingdom, to make us stronger, to make us better. We are continuing to move forward in every way. I want, oh, Irene Patrick watching from Ethiopia. This is your first time viewing. Sister Irene, the enemy might have tried to stop us, but we want to send some love to you. Amen. Living manna loves you. We welcome you. Continue to join us. Thank God for you. Who else did I want to send a shout out to? I want to send a shout out to our awesome tech team behind the scene. Brother Gavin, Brother J brother Josh, look, man, uh, I don't know how Sabbath appropriate it is, but y'all are some beasts back there, brothers. <laughs> I'm telling you, y'all on top of it. The sound, the picture, I mean, they, were, they started communicating me immediately when things went crazy over here, but we're we going to tighten this up. Praise God. Thank y'all. Love y'all. Praying for y'all back there, the tech team. Sister Patrice, our producer, love you. Beautiful picture of you. Saw you on the video there. That was great. And so I think that's everybody, except I've got to send a shout out to Brother Sean and Veronica Myers. Mm -hmm. Listen, Brother Sean brought that word last night to us and ministered to us and encouraged us so much. We love y'all. Thank God for y'all. Because of what God is doing in and through your lives, our lives are being changed. So Amen. thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. We, we love you. And now, Sister Amra, what praise reports do you have to read today? Well, first, I wanted just to say what a privilege it is uh, just to be on the prayer team where we get to watch the Lord work. Amen. I mean, firsthand. It's Front row so seat. awesome. So I wanted to say, if any of you have praise reports or prayers that you would like to send in, um, please send us an email at pray at livingmana.church. 
Again, that's pray at livingmana.church, or you can find me on Mighty Networks and send me your praise report there. Amen. Amen. Before you start, okay. look, one of the tech team lives really close by, and I recently met him. He was right here in my home, and I'm going to get whooped on if I don't. Brother Colin, <laughs> bro, you the man. Listen, came in and helped me get the camera and all that set up, and we can doing some work on the studio. Thank you, Gigi. I saw you in the chat. I'm, we're going to stop. We'll stop everything for love around here. So, Brother Colin, you're not overlooked, brother, or forgotten. So, thank you, my man. Also, right. praying for your brother, too. Amen. All right. The first praise report comes from Monica Titus. She's in Texas, and she says, my local church is growing. We just had a baptism of five people and several transfers. The Lord is doing something with his people. I'm a part of the prayer team, women's ministry, Sabbath school teacher, and Adventist youth participant. And Monica is also a good friend of Living Mana Online Church, and she has helped us Amen. immensely. So we are so appreciative of her. And then our next one comes from Pauline Shomo Goodine. Hello, Pauline. We love you. I want to thank my fellow prayer warriors for praying for tequila. Her ex-husband gave her very little money to take care of his children. He was giving her what he wanted to give, not what the court ordered him to. He failed to report other income that he receives, and he did not pay her alimony as stated in the final divorce decree. The judge ruled in her favor, praise God, and now he has to pay her back child support. Next week, the judge will rule on her alimony case. She is very happy and wanted me to thank the prayer warriors for praying for her. From Sabrina, original prayer request was, I was very nervous and distracted after my daughter's prenatal appointment yesterday evening. We were told that the baby had stopped growing and her blood pressure is spiking and she is to be admitted tomorrow morning in order to be delivered. Amen. She was not expected to deliver for another week or two. I'm asking your prayers for my daughter. If you are willing, tomorrow is scary for her and could come with some complications, but we serve a mighty God and I believe he will provide. And then the praise report came in. Thank you all for your prayers. My daughter had her baby and both are doing well. God is good. Yes, he is. From Wendy Claudio. This prayer request was sent from Wendy's friend. When you are on the prayer line, please pray for Josh. He is a trucker and works with Joel. Someone hit his car on his way to work this morning. The other car was running from the police. Josh was raised SDA. Also pray for Joel. These young men need a relationship with the Lord. I'm sending this out to everyone so that they can pray for this young man. We don't have information on how he is doing yet, but I'm requesting for everyone to lift this young man up in prayer. And then the praise report came in. Hello, Terry and prayer warriors. I cannot thank you enough for your prayers on behalf of Josh. I myself do not know Josh personally, but when my friend sent me the picture of the car accident and the prayer request, I had to move fast. This morning, I received a text from my friend that Josh is doing well. He was discharged from the hospital and sent home this morning to God be the glory. We know that Satan tries his best to destroy, devour, demolish, etc. But Satan's best is not enough when Jesus Christ steps in. In Josh's case, as you prayed, God stepped in. I forward the prayer you sent to my friend so that she can forward the prayer to Josh as well. I believe it is important that both Josh and Joel understand where their help came from. God is in control and he hears the pleas, the cry, the pleas, the cries, the petitions of his children. Thank you so much. This is truly a praise report. Amen. 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 And now this one. This one is is hot off the press. <laughs> this one Sister Jody. Yes, Jody McClure, we happen to catch table. we happen to catch your uh praise in the chat a little while ago. Today for church, I have access to the big TV in the living room. This never happens. Anyway, during the Q&A, my dad, the non-believer, came and sat down just in time for the fifth commandment question. 
honor thy father and mother. Amen. I was praying like crazy because this is a first connection to Living Mana online church experience for my dad. And God really used the time well. Praise him. Well, thank you for sharing that, Jody. I love real time praise Amen. reports <laughs> and what God's doing right here at Living Mana Online Church live broadcast. Amen. So, thank you so much. Come on, somebody. There, there that that is no coincidence at all. Mm -hmm. And thank you for sharing that, Sister Jody, and everyone else that is watching and participating. We don't know the good that we do, how far it will go, how far reaching it is, and how God is using it. So give God all you got today. Thank you. See you there, Brother Earl, in the chat live, live in the chat. We love you, my man. And uh, thank you so much. That's a living man, a prayer warrior. Also want to send a shout out to our warrior sister, Sister Jerry. I, we see you there in the chat, mm -hmm. Sister Jerry. We family here. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so thank you so much for your beautiful life. And so, look, last week, we're going to go to the throne of grace. But before we do, I want to give you two words that to take with you. We can take with us to the throne of grace. Last week, it was let. The Lord just put that one word in my heart, let. And as soon as the pastor started preaching, some of you caught it and said, oh, Terry, let. Well, the Lord laid two words on my heart this, this week. Listen and meditate. Mm. Listen and meditate. You remember the Tower of Babel, how no one could understand each other's language after the Lord came down and confound them. Now, the enemy, he's not a creator of anything new, but he's a pretty good counterfeit artist. And so strategically and tactically in this warfare, he will take something that once was used on him and try to use that thing on us to see just how forgetful we are. And if we are listening to God and meditating on what God is saying. And so one of the things, saints, everybody has a revelation. Everybody's got a testimony. Everybody's excited about the stuff God's doing in their life. Or we either complain and moan and groan about it. But either way, we're saying something. And so if everybody's talking, who's listening, who's meditating, and who's learning? I love what Todd said today about sharks. Misinformation can cause us to get the wrong impression about mm -hmm. sharks, and he had to learn, I was once fearing sharks and had the wrong idea, but the professionals have helped me to understand that sharks are some awesome, amazing creatures. And he took that and applied that lesson to God. Also to us building this church saints, we want to learn sometime, just pray that prayer, Lord, place a guard over my lip and let me just hold my tongue for a minute. Sometimes I need to pray about that. As I was saying, saints, <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> I could have never got away with that. I but mean, in a all, true lesson we're all a work for us, progress, saints, right? let us let us listen and meditate. God is saying something special to us and about us, about him. And he wants to do an amazing work. He is doing amazing works. But let's listen and meditate. Amen. Can we go to the throne of grace together? Amen. Precious Father, in the mighty and majestic name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, your son, we always want to remember to come to you in faith. For your word declares that without faith, it is impossible to please you. For he that cometh to you first must believe that you are and that you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. Mm -hmm. So help us to diligently seek you, Lord. If there's no obstacles, if there's no barriers, if there's no distractions, if there's no storms, if there's no struggle and no trouble, then we don't have to be diligent. We can just call on the name of Jesus like we do sometimes, and you're there instantly, and we thank you for that faithfulness. But Father, we know you're working out of us, Lord God, giving, forming our characters and teaching us to trust you and, and showing the world around us, Lord, what a triumphant faith this we have, Lord, and what a wonderful God we have. And how could we show the world that our God's a healer if we never come through the storm of sickness and disease? How can we show the world that we have a God who is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother if we've never allowed you to comfort us in our loneliness? If we've never allowed someone to put their arm around us in the name of Jesus and love us. And so, Father, we just give you glory today for the diligence that you have placed in our faith. And thank you for giving us the strength to persevere. And so as we come in faith today, we want to, to, to acknowledge that you are greater than any of these things we're about to lay before you. These struggles and these trials are not greater than our God. God, you are greater. Just as your grace is greater than all of our sins. I pray in the name of Jesus 
that everyone within the sound of my voice today, as we are in faith before your throne, we expect something, God. We're anticipating you're going to do something. We're looking for you to do something, God. And Father, we're stretching out our hands, receiving from you what you have provided, Lord. All we will ever need, thine hand hath provided, Amen. is providing, and will continue to provide. For great is your faithfulness, Holy Father in heaven. And so we thank you today in Jesus' name, Lord. And as we come, now we can come with boldness and confidence and faith that our Father is more than able. Every question that was asked today, our First Lady dealing with family issues and, and, and social issues and psychological issues, thank you for those questions that were answered. Dealing with anxiety and depression, Lord. Teach us to be present here, Lord, for you are a living God that's present here. We can have full hope for the future based on what you have accomplished in the past. And thank you for the answers to questions that past, Pastor answered. Thank you for helping us to understand context, Lord. Thank you for helping us to slow down, be still, be quiet, and listen, Lord, for you've given us all the answers right here in this amazing book, your living word. And thank you for the spirit of truth that is here to teach us, lead us, and guide us, oh God. Help us, Lord, to be still, meditate, and listen as you're speaking in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you for Living Man of Church, our board, our leaders, our members, and all of our ministries. Everyone, Lord, we lift them up to you today. They are yours. This is your church. Heal, touch, save, deliver, and bless in every way in Jesus' name, Lord. Father, we want to thank you for the memorial of Brother Sean, the memory of Brother Sean, the life of Brother Sean, the gift of Brother Sean, and all that he has left behind. Thank you for Crystal, Lord, and her children, and Scarlet, Lord. Thank you for precious sky. And Lord, if sky is listening today, may the love of God touch her heart. May the peace of God touch her heart and fill her heart and teach us how we can reach out, Lord, here at Living Manor and embrace them with the love of Jesus and let them know that they are a part of this family. Thank you for this beautiful people, Lord. Thank you for Sean's sister. She may be listening today. Thank you for her participating with us last night. May it not just be a one-time visit, Lord. May she come here and find what it was that drew her brother in and what it was he was in love with and what it was that he stood for, what it was that made him shout, King Jesus reigns. What it was that showed him that this is a church without walls, no barriers and no restrictions. And we ain't trying to bring folk up in here and corral them and treat them wrong, but we're trying to love folk and see folks healed and supported and recovered in the name of Jesus. We are not perfect, but hallelujah, you, we serve a perfect God who is perfecting us. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Thank you for Sister Leela Peterson, Lord God, who wants to offer a prayer for Astasha and her family. Uh, uh, who uh, 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 we're praying that they will get to know the Lord and come to know him, Lord, in Jesus' name, and continue to pray for Wes and Leela as they prepare for their move, Lord. Sister Jamie is reminding us to pray for Daryl, Lord, and his career move and decisions. Uh, 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 Dorenzo, who may be involved in some demonic activities. Brother David, who is homeless, Lord God, by choice. Move in the three Ds, Daryl, Dorenzo, and David, Lord. Move in their lives. We started praying for them last week, and we want to continue to lift up prayers for them. Thank you for Sister Jamie, Lord, uh, Darren Compton, who's given us the intel we need, specific details on their lives. We're praying, lead Daryl in the right choices for his career, Lord, that what you have called him to do. And God, break bondages and shackles in and around Dorenzo's life, Lord God, by the anointing, Lord, that the enemy do not deceive him and fool him. And David, Lord, we, who is chosen to be homeless for whatever reason, oh Lord, we pray that you move upon his mind and move upon his heart, Lord God, and show him that you have a place for him, Father, first in your house, God, and then you want to take up a body in his house, his soul temple, Lord God, and then you have so much for him, and we just give you praise and glory for it. Thank you for Brother Taj and Revelation of Hope and that powerful message that you gave us today. We shout out to Sister Zadwa, who said it in the chat, Lord, powerful Bless message today in Jesus' name. Bless Sister Zadwa, who is continually being a blessing to us. Jamie also wants to ask for healing and comfort for Brother Eddie today. Lord, you know what the specifics of that is. You are still Jehovah Rapha. You are still our healer. Lord, you can heal. Lord, with just as a speaking a word, Lord, from your lips, you can make it happen. And thank you for Sister Christie's family who's traveling today. Grant them traveling mercies, Lord. Sister Desiree Charles is praying that that desire in her heart to be close to you would grow. 
Thank you for that prayer request today, Lord. We each need that desire, Lord. There is a longing and a hungering and a thirsting in each of our hearts. And Father, we keep finding ourselves deceived by these allurements and enticements of the enemy in this world that look so attractive and pull us away from you, that take our time and our resources and our energies and our efforts. Lord, in Jesus' name, may we desire only you, for you are indeed the desire of nations, Lord Jesus. Come, fill our hearts, O Lord, we pray. Thank you, Sister Desiree. Zaib in Pakistan, we're praying that you continue to use him there, Lord God. Put peace in his young heart, Lord. Give him tact and wisdom, Lord God, to know how, Lord God, that his good not be evil spoken of, that people not misunderstand his intentions. Help him, O oh Lord God. Take him by the hand. Lead and guide this precious young one in Jesus' name. And thank you for Sister Charlotte and her connections with him and all the work that she has been doing there, Lord. Thank you for Sister Charlotte, Lord, today, as we lift her up before you and give you praise for her. Sherry Atwa is praying for her children, Zach and Hannah, oh Lord God, that you will send help meets for them, Lord God, and those who they can make connections with will help them along the way in their growth and development. Put your arm around Zach and, and Hannah, Lord God, and be with them in Jesus' name. Lord, may, they, may their lives be as, as prophetic and fulfilling as their names are, Zach and Hannah, in Jesus' name. And Sister Sheila Izzard is asking that we pray for the Holloway family. And so we lift the Holloway family up before you, Lord, surround them and bless them in the name of Jesus. We plead the blood of the lamb upon them, around them, between them and the enemy today, God, that you will work your will in and through their lives. And Sister Samantha Wright is asking um, for her son, Lord God. He has looked into rehab, but he hasn't taken that step. Lord, we pray for this precious young one that you give him the desire, Lord God. Remember, we had a, a saying out there, Lord God, that I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so, Father God, even as the man by the pool, Bethesda was waiting, Lord God, Lord God, to, to step in, Lord God, thinking maybe that was the answer. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you come alongside this young soul, Lord God, and ask him that question. Will thou be made whole and allow him to rise up and walk in Jesus name and be free from these bondages? I've seen you do it, God. I've seen you do it and experienced it firsthand, and I know you are able. And so, Lord God, with Sister Samantha Wright and her son and anyone else that knows somebody today that's caught up in addiction, Lord God, I pray you would draw people to the STAR program and teach our leaders who are involved in that to use wisdom, Lord God, and to use discretion, Father, and to hold on to the hand of omnipotence when helping others come out of these bondages, Lord God, that we would learn what it means to get out of the way and let Jesus make a way. And we just praise you for it, God, today. Thank you for Sister Donna Bogue is praying for her husband and her children that they will come to fully accept you. And so, Lord, just reveal yourself to them and show them that you are greater than anything they may be holding on to. I pray that we all learn, oh God, today with Donna and her husband and her children, that what we're giving up, it's nothing compared to what you are giving. We praise you for that in Jesus' name. Miss Edwards has asked us, Lord, to stop and pray for the world. Now, Lord, this prayer request is requiring that we move out of ourselves and out of our own way and move and, and seek to look at this world through your eyes, oh God, to seek to look at the situation through the eyes uh, of the master, because, Lord, we would be completely overwhelmed. Your word says that men's hearts will be failing them in this very hour, looking upon the things that are coming upon this world. Don't ever let us look at this mess down here without your guidance and without your eyes and without the eyes of faith, oh God because it's too much to behold. And so we join our faith with our beloved and precious sister, Miss Edwards, Lord. That Lord, you would move in this world as you have shown us. We are people of the book and a people of prophecy. You've shown us what's coming, God. You've shown us what to expect. But Lord, we've seen the end of the story. We've listened to heaven's diary, oh God. And we know that we can be on the winning side. And so we pray, oh Lord, in Jesus' name, save now, oh God. Heal, touch, save, and stretch forth thine hand and do miracles in the name of thy holy child, Jesus, Lord. And Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. Mm. Don't do it without us. Don't do it without living manna. Don't do it without us, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Father, again, we want to thank you for Tom and Joyce, who are Fisher. Tom and Joyce Fisher are feeding the homeless right now. And we pray, God, be with them. 
because we know your heart is for the poor. And you said, them who lend it to the, give it to the poor, lend it to the Lord, and that which they have given, he will repay. And so, Father, we pray that you be with them, multiply their seed that is sown in Jesus' mighty name, and make sure that they always have what they need to give, an abundance, an overflowing abundance. May they not even find room to, to, to store this stuff up that it always got to be given out something in Jesus' name. Thank you. For these precious souls, Tom and Joyce Fisher today in Jesus' glorious name, mm -hmm. feeding the homeless. Hallelujah. We praise you for it, Lord. Thank you for Sister Jody McClure and her dad. May the seed that has been sown today uh, through the Sabbath school message and the word that came forth, may that seed take root. May the living man of prayer team continue to water it. May we all water it with prayer, Lord God, and see an incredible harvest come forth. Thank you for Kenya sells homes, praying for her husband. Her and her husband to have a closer walk with you, Lord. In Jesus' name, draw them today. We give you the glory, honor, and praise. We lift up this precious couple before you right now, Lord. And Lord, Sister Jackie Carr is praying for her son, Zach. He's in the Army, and he's traveling from Washington to California. And Father, I know firsthand you can keep, heal, touch, save, and deliver. We lift Zach up before you right now. Thank you for this mother and for her heart for her son, Lord God. In Jesus' glorious name. Thank you, Lord, that you're watching over and keeping and protecting them today. Michelle Crombie is praying for her son and her family and his family, Lord God, that they will be kept and protected, Lord. Watch over and keep them in Jesus' name. Norma Balderas is praying for her grandson, Aiden. Aiden Balderas, 11 weeks ago, was diagnosed with cancer, Father, and we lift him up before you, first him, first Aiden. We pray, Lord, that this diagnosis would not cause fear to arise in his heart. Pastor Sean Myers ministered to us last night and said, one of the things that have taken so many out is fear in this thing with cancer, mm -hmm. fear. Many who would be healed, many who would reach up and take hold of the hand of omnipotence, many who would have the will to fight, many who would, who would rest in you and trust in you are consumed by fear, causing the cancer to take over, causing them to be weakened, Lord God. But in the name of Jesus, we come against fear right now. May the love of God, may the communion of the Holy Ghost, may the manifestation of your divine glory in his life, Lord God, consume him today, Lord, in whatever way you have to get to this young, precious soul. And not only him, but all of our people who are hearing about this cancer invading us, oh Lord, Father God. For your word says, whoever love, whoever fears has not been made perfect in love, for fear had to torment. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. Shed your love abroad in, in the hearts of each one of our cancer patients, oh Lord God, in Jesus' name, and show them that they are more than conquerors. You said you will remove sickness and disease from our midst, Lord. You never said it wouldn't come, but you did say you would remove it. And so today, by faith, we pray with confidence and assurance. We humble ourselves before you, Lord, for you have already declared it in your word. You swore by your own holiness, your own self, saying, blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee, made this promise to our father Abraham. And then you said, if we are Christ, then we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so today we come before your throne on your Sabbath day, where we saw you healing them all so many times, Lord Jesus, and we claim our inheritance from you today, humbly, yet boldly, humbly, let com yet confidently, Lord God reverently yet with faith lord because our faith is not in ourselves not in our doctors not in nothing but in you god whom have we on earth besides you lord whom in heaven we have no one but you god and we know you are able and so we give you the praise honor and glory for aiden and for all of our people lord god who are facing this thing in Jesus' name, drive out this enemy, Lord. Your word says, when a man or woman's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace. Mm -hmm. We thank you for this today in Jesus' glorious name, Father. And finally, Lord God, we pray for Shelly Manning. She's praying for her family, her husband, her son, and her daughter to come to know you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And so, Father, we just lift him up, draw them, save them, even through her faithful prayers, even through her faithful service and her loving care. And so, Lord God, thank you for this time of prayer today. We took a little time today, Lord God, but we pray you double it up, triple it up a hundredfold with the blessings and with the answers in Jesus' name. And all God's people declare. Amen. 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 When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain moved. 
There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I'll lay. The battle belongs to you And if you are for me Who can be against me? For Jesus there's nothing impossible for you Amen, amen. The battle belongs to the Lord. It is now time for the word of God. And saints, today's message is entitled, Give Me Jesus. You can have the world, take all the world, but give me Jesus. We don't know exactly what the sermon's going to be about, but we know that's the title. And what we want to encourage you to do now, saints, is again, get out pencil, paper, pen, pad, iPad, iPad whatever it is, whatever way you take notes. We, we did this last week. And what we want to do is enrich your afterglow experience. And one of the ways we do that to get the most out of the sermon is, yeah, we, you, we did last week three points. I'm going to do those same three points. OK, what lesson? Is God teaching me in this sermon? What is God saying to me? How can I take that lesson and apply it to my life now, this week? Once I've done that, how is that lesson going to affect my life in a positive way and the lives of others around me? That simple. And then bring those notes with you to the afterglow. Now, the afterglow is 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 a is a pretty wild party. I'm gonna be honest with you. We have a good time there. And uh <laughs> And we're going to have some special hosts there today, but we want you to really think, meditate and listen as you hear the word today. Yeah. And as the pastor gets ready to come to bring the word, I want to assure you all that we are seeing your prayer request. Sister Alicia Northington, that was a very serious prayer request. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm sorry that I didn't get to mention it, but we also need more prayer warriors. So pray about that as you're listening and meditating. Lord, 
are you calling me to join the ranks of this prayer team? Because we're about to launch an endeavor, a big one, and we need more prayer warriors. It's exciting, too. Very exciting. So prepare for the word of God, saints. We love you. Thank God for you. We are a new creation, not bound by the mistakes of the past. Our failures do not dictate our future. There is no mistake that Jesus cannot turn into beauty. He is the brush and we are the paint. With him, our blemishes are washed clean. Freedom is ours through Jesus. Let him be the sculptor and us the clay, carving away our selfish ways the creator of the earth molding us into a work of art, a one-of-a-kind masterpiece brought to life. In us is unlimited potential that God can use. You were made with marvelous intricacy. You are beautiful and valued. God has orchestrated a tailor-made plan for your life. May a symphony of love and kindness follow you. Reach out to Christ and grab this life. Walk confidently in the knowledge that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Because God's plan for your life is filled with hope and a future. Amen. I'm going to invite you uh, to pray with me as we prepare to uh, launch out into the deep. So please, um, let, us, uh, let us seek the Lord's face and prepare our hearts uh, to hear from Him. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you would please speak through me. Take this bread, Lord. Bless it, break it, multiply it, that it may feed those who are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. In the book of Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, beginning with verse 6, the Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. This call for the world to be ready for the coming of Jesus, for the judgment of God, is an extremely important call. And this call goes out because God wants to prepare the world for his second coming. If, if you want to be ready for the second coming, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and put that one in the chat as we, as we lay the foundation for this message uh, today. If you want to be ready for the second coming, put that one in the chat because today we're going to talk about what it means uh, to be ready for the second coming. Uh, the Bible calls us to fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come now to break this text down and to and to really pull some lessons uh, uh, of of how we are to be ready for this judgment. I'm going to go to another verse in the Bible. We're going to explore another story 
in the Old Testament. Uh, that's going to take us to the book of 1 Kings chapter 3. And I'm going to read to you verse 28, which you will see is very similar to the verse we just read in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 28, And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. I want you to note the parallels between the verse we are reading now and the verse we just read in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. In both verses, there are kings. In both verses, there is the, uh, the people that are fearing the king. In both verses, there is judgment. And, and I, I'm, I'm paralleling, paralleling these two verses because what we're going to learn about how to be ready for the judgment, how to be able to pass the judgment, is actually found in the story that first, excuse me, first Kings chapter three is actually unfolding before us. So note with me, first Kings chapter three, what is the context? What is the context of first Kings chapter three, verse 28? Who is the king? Who are the people that are fearing the king? What is the judgment that the king did that made the people fear him? Let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 5. So this is the same chapter, but we're going up to verse 5, which is an introduction to, what, to, to the context of verse 28. The Bible says in verse 5, In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or to come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. So let's come back for a moment. And what I want you to note here is what Solomon asked God for in this dream. He asked him for wisdom to be able to judge between good and bad. He's saying, Lord, give me wisdom to judge. Give me wisdom for judgment. So we now understand that the context of 1 Kings chapter 3 is about judgment. Very interesting in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, fear God for the hour of his judgment is come. So we're beginning to see some parallels here. Solomon is asking for wisdom in order to judge the people and discern between good and bad. And so... The, the story goes on. Let's go back to the screen. Um, we're now in verse, uh, verse 11. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment, behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any be arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And so, verse 14, 
If thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. So at this point, Solomon has now become the wisest man to ever live. At that moment, God has given him what he asked for, wisdom to discern between good and bad. And now notice the next verse, verse 15. Verse 15, and Solomon awoke and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. So now let's break this down. What's happening here <clears throat> is that Solomon has been dreaming. The Lord speaks to him in the dream. Solomon says, I want wisdom to discern between good and bad. And in the dream, God says, I have given it to you. So at that moment when God says, I have given it to you, Solomon is officially now the wisest man to ever live. The Bible says he wakes up, realizes he was dreaming, and so he goes to Jerusalem to thank God for what he has given him. He goes to Jerusalem to thank God for the gift of wisdom. And the Bible says he is there in the middle of this praise and, and a praise service thanking God. And now notice the next word. The Bible says in verse 16, then, then, then. So what does then mean here? Then would mean not a few days later, not a few weeks later, not a few months later, but while he is at Jerusalem in the temple, thanking God for the dream that he just had the night before, where God says, I'm going to give you wisdom to discern between good and evil, to judge my people. While this is happening, while he's celebrating and praising, the Bible says, then, let's read the rest of the verse, then came there two women. They were harlots unto the king, that were harlots, I'm, I'm sorry, that were harlots unto the king, and stood before him. And the one woman said, O my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also. And we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. All right, so let's break the story down. These two women are now standing before Solomon and they've got a complaint. There's a baby with them. And the complaint is one of the women says, listen, I was, we, were, we, we two were in the house. We both had, had, had babies. And in the night while I slept, she lost her baby, was sleeping on her baby, slept on her baby, lost the baby. And therefore, she switched her dead child with my living child. That's what they're coming to Solomon. That's the issue that they've brought before Solomon. Now note, note what happens next. Verse, tw verse 21. Verse 21. And when I arose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. And now I want you to note what Solomon does here. And the, and the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to the one and half to the other. There goes Solomon's solution. Divide the living child, give half to this woman, give the other half to this woman. What happens next? 
Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O my Lord, give her the living child and in no wise slay it. But the other said, let it neither be mine nor thine, but divide it. Wow. Then the king answered and said, give her the living child and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged. And they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. Now we understand, beloved, the context of this verse. There is the story that we're about to break down. Solomon, in all his wisdom, cannot remember. He is the wisest man now living. And these two women come before him, and one of them, listen carefully to me, y'all, one of them is such a good actor that she has Solomon fooled. Do y'all catch that? One of these women is such a good actor that she has Solomon fooled. And so how does Solomon solve the crisis? He says, bring me a sword and divide the child. Let's pause right there. In this story, Solomon is the king. He is the king in the temple. Please put a, put a one in the chat if y'all are already catching the parallel. Solomon is the king in the temple. And these two women, so let me emphasize this, there are two women that come before the king. Let me say it again, y'all. Two women that come before the king. And now I need you to understand, beloved, that in the book of Revelation, in the judgment that is occurring in the book of Revelation, there are two women involved in that judgment. One woman is described in Revelation chapter 12 as the true church, while the other woman, Revelation chapter 17, is described as the harlot church. Now, in this story, the Bible says both women were harlots. Now, I want you to know that some translations actually say both women were innkeepers, and some people believe that the word harlot is a mistranslation. Nevertheless, that's not the, we're not focused on that right now. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The fact is we have two women coming before the king, two churches, you guys. One is telling the truth, and the other is not. However, in this story, we're not going to be dealing with the true church and the false church because in this story, both women are in one house. And so for this sermon, we're going to focus our attention on the fact that in God's house, there are two types of Christians. Put a one in the chat if y'all are following so far. In God's house, there are two types of Christians. Those, <laughs> let, me, let me do it this way. What is the argument about between these two women? They're arguing over the child. This is not a female child. This is a male child. In other words, the argument is this. Who truly possesses the son. Let me say that again. The argument in this story between these two women that, that are professing something, both are professing to possess the son, but only one truly has the son. If y'all are with me, put a five in the chat, please. And what I need you to understand is very simple. The judgment is really about one thing and one thing only. Who truly possesses the son? Who really 
has Jesus. Hence the title, Give Me Jesus. Now, now please note that the reason that the woman that lost her child, lost her child, is because she slept on the child. So let me say it in plain terms, y'all. Do not sleep on Jesus. If you sleep on Jesus, you will run the risk of certainly losing Jesus. Don't sleep on Jesus. If you're following me, again, put that five in the chat. The judgment is answering a very simple question. Who has Jesus and who does not? Remember, both claim that the child belongs to them. Let's read it again. First Kings chapter three, verse 20. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I arose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. I need you to understand, beloved, that many claim to have Jesus but they do not really possess Jesus. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not have Jesus? Did we not pro pro prophesy in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Beloved, understand, understand that there will be those who claim to have Jesus, but do not really have him. And there will be those who claim to have Jesus and really have him. The title of the sermon is Give Me Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the key to the judgment. Jesus is the key to passing that judgment. Jesus is the key to coming through that judgment and coming through with the favor of God. Give me Jesus. Solomon in all his wisdom cannot determine who is acting and who isn't. In other words, one of these women is a good performer. And beloved, I must say that for so many of us, we know how to pretend being a Christian. We know how to pretend. We know how to act like Jesus. We know how to act like we're Christian when we are not really. I was looking, there was a, 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 a statement I saw the other day from a preacher who said, uh, many of us complained about wearing masks to church, but you've been used to doing it all the time. The quote went something like that, and I was just like, what? Wow. Many of us argue, many of us complain about wearing masks to church, but we do it all the time. And I thought to myself, man, that, if that's not a statement, wow. Wow. Lord, help me. Help me not to put on a mask. Help me not to be, not to be a pseudo-Christian. Let me ask you a question. Do we have such confidence in our ability to pretend to be Christians that we feel comfortable going before God, standing in the presence of God, In this story, both women appear to desperately want the son, but one has no child. One has no son. One has no savior. One simply does not possess Christ. One has Christ, the other does not. So the question is, how does God determine who really possesses Jesus? How does Solomon go about to determine who really possesses the child? And his, in his mind, he's got one simple question, and it is this. Who loves the child the best? That's what he's after. He just wants to know who, whoever's child this is, they will love the child. Who loves 
the child. This is the deciding question. The true owner of the child, note this with me, the true owner of the child was willing to rather suffer herself than to cause the child to suffer. That's who really possessed the child. The true owner of the child was rather, was willing to rather suffer herself than to let the child suffer. In fact, when the true mother said, give her the child, she was actually, she was willing to look like a liar. Mm. She was willing to suffer as a wrongdoer while not being a wrongdoer. She was willing to be falsely accused than to see the child suffer. And I need you to understand that in taking this position, in taking this position, she was literally reflecting the character of the Son of God, who himself came to this world and was willing to suffer on our behalf, was willing to look guilty while he was absolutely innocent. I need y'all to catch this, beloved. She would rather be broken herself than have the child harmed. And the question is, would we, would we rather deny self or hurt the child? Because let me tell you, every time we sin, we hurt the child, you all. Every time we sin, we sin, we hurt the son. So, so now this woman is reflecting the character of Christ. That's what Christ would do. Christ would suffer the, the innocent on behalf of the guilty. So the false woman, she was willing to divide the child. Let me break this down. The false woman was content with half of the child, part of the child. The false Christian is content with half of Jesus, a quarter of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I'll take Jesus when I go to church and when I go to the world, I want the world. You cannot have both Jesus and the world. You can't have some of Jesus and some of self. Some of Jesus and some of anger. Some of Jesus and some of pride. Some of Jesus and some of gossip. Some of Jesus and some of lusting. Some of Jesus and some of lying. Some of Jesus and some of hatred. You either you have the whole child or you do not have the child at all. Because half of Jesus may as well be none of Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. The false woman, the false Christian is content with half of Jesus. She's content with dividing the body. Why did the woman with the child, why did the woman whose child it really was, why did she love the child? That's the question for us. Why does this woman love the child? Why does the mother love the child? And if you're a mother out there, you will know the answer is very simple. Why does this mother love the child, her child? The mother loves the child because the child is her child, meaning the child had been formed within her. I think I may need to say that again. The child had been formed within her. So, so, so if the child is formed within her, the child is a part of her. And now we begin to understand and ask a question to ourselves, man, if I am to be the true Christian, then, oh, I get it. Oh, wait a minute. What does the text say? Galatians 4.19, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed within you. Ah, oh, wait a minute. 
So, Pastor, are you telling me that Christ is supposed to be formed within me? Yes, beloved, Christ is supposed to be formed within you. Because if he is formed within you, then he is yours. Colossians 1 verse 27, to whom God would make known what the riches of this glory, of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Beloved, has Jesus been formed within you? Has Jesus been formed within you? Are you carrying the Son in you? Let, let me say it this way, beloved. Jesus must be yours. He cannot be your mother's Jesus. He cannot be your pastor's Jesus. He cannot be your elder's Jesus. He cannot be your brother's Jesus, your sister's Jesus. It must be your Jesus. He must be your Jesus. You must have a personal connection with him. He must be formed within. And when the child is formed within, when the son is formed within, we will do all to preserve his life in us. We will not allow nothing to smother him. We would rather die than hurt the son. When I was preaching some time back, my little girls, my younger girls were, were babies at the time, were little, you know, maybe, I don't know, um, four, five, somewhere around there. And we had gone to this church. I don't remember if it was in Nebraska. I don't remember where we were. Big church. We went and I was going to speak. And um, as I was preaching, my phone started going off. And it was, I, I noticed that it was going off like 20 minutes out from my, from my sermon being over. And then when the sermon was done, my wife comes up to me and she's like, we can't find Genesis. We can't find Genesis. And so I'm like, I just immediately go into, we need to go look for her right now. And we begin looking and then before you know it, like five minutes pass, 10 minutes pass, 15 minutes pass, 20 minutes pass, and now the police have come to the church. And the whole church is looking for Genesis. And I want you to imagine what a parent feels when they think that their child may be gone. Do we have that kind of emotion? Do we have that kind of panic if you haven't heard from Jesus in 10, 15, 20 minutes? Some of us go that long not hearing from Jesus for years. If he was, your, if he was related to you, it would be a different story, I promise you. You know, when somebody else's child does something, when, when something happens to someone else, it's very difficult for us to connect because, oh, that's not my blood. But beloved, if Jesus is yours, if Jesus is yours, now praise God. My daughter was found using the bathroom, just singing on the toilet bowl. La, 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 la. Just hanging out in the bathroom. Praise God. But if you're a parent, you know there is nothing more dreadful than thinking that your child has been taken from you. So the question now becomes, how does Solomon determine who truly loves the child? And here is the answer, beloved. Here is the answer. Solomon says, read it with me. And the king said, bring me a sword. Bring me a sword. Uh, yeah, yeah. Y'all need to slow down and just catch that. Catch that. If you're thinking what I'm thinking, you're thinking right. Bring me a sword. Bring me a sword. 
For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents. Of Bring me the word of God. I, here's how I'm going to determine who truly loves a child. Here's how I'm going to determine how much you really love Jesus. Bring me the word. Bring me the word. Why? If you love me. If you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. If you love me, you're going to honor my word. If you love me, you're going to follow my word. So bring me the sword because I will, I will be able to determine your relationship with me by your relationship with the word. How do you respond to the word of God. You remember in the book of Exodus chapter 16, then said the Lord unto Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. God used the word in the Old Testament to prove the people. I'm going to see if y'all really love me. I'm going to see if you're really willing to follow me. So I'm going to rain manna down from heaven. Listen, y'all, I'm going to test Israel by their response to the manna, their response to the word. And I need you to understand what happens with Israel. Because remember, Israel was very hungry. They were like, hey, you know, we're hungry. We need food. God starts raining manna down from heaven. And when he first begins to rain down the manna, they're like, praise the Lord, manna. And they're going out and they're gathering the manna, right? And then God rains down manna more days. And more days, the children of Israel are like, yes, manna, manna, manna. And they go grab the manna. And then, you know, weeks pass and it's still manna. And the children of Israel begin to react like, huh, huh, oh boy, more manna? A couple weeks later, man, oh, <laughs> more manna? And they get to the place, beloved, where the Bible says, the Bible says, watch this, and it shall come to pass, watch this, uh, um, uh, and the people spake against God and against Moses, Numbers 21, verse 5, wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there water, and our soul loatheth this light manna. They got to the place where they hated the, 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 the bread that God had been raining down from them. Beloved, how do you respond to the word of God? When God is raining manna down from heaven for you, how do you respond to that manna? How do you respond to that word? Many of us go to church on Sabbath looking for manna. <clears throat> Whew. Many of us go to church on Sabbath looking for manna, not realizing that that's not when God rains the manna down, y'all. God rained manna down every day of the week. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. First day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. And on the seventh day, there was no manna. Hmm. Y'all understand this? <laughs> if, you're, if you're struggling because, man, I'm not being fed. Could it be that it's because you're not eating during the week and you just come to church on Sabbath looking for manna? And you may get some. But, beloved, it's not enough to sustain you. You can't eat once a week. You got to eat bread. You got to eat the word of God daily. So God says, listen, I'm going to test you to see how you respond to my word. Psalm 119, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, beloved. Listen, it is the word of God. It is the word of God hidden in our hearts that, that reveals whether we're truly walking with God or not. I need you to understand this because the manna not only represents the word of God, but it also represents Jesus himself. This is why the Bible says in John 6, 51, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So Jesus says, look, I am the sword. I am the bread. My word is the bread. And he says, look, I am the bread that has come down to give you everlasting life. And the life that I give is my flesh. The flesh that I give is my life, which I will give for the world. So watch this then. Jesus saying, 
The bread is a symbol of my life that I have given for the world. Now, why is that significant in the context of our study? I want you to note this. In, in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four, 24, uh, the Bible says, And when he, that is Jesus, had given thanks, he broke it. He broke the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Listen, y'all. <laughs> Jesus was divided for us. His body was broken for us. Mm. His body was broken for us. He suffered for us. He was broken in death for us. And because he was broken for us, our response should be no more breaking for Jesus. No more suffering for Jesus. You suffered for me. I am willing to suffer for you. See, the Bible says in Matthew 21, Matthew 21, verse 24, it says, Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Yeah, beloved, we want to be broken. It's our turn to be broken. Jesus, you died for us. You were broken for us. Now, no longer, no longer, we're not going to, I don't want to see you suffer anymore. I, let me be broken. Let me fall on the rock and be broken. Now, we're about to take what seems like a, like a crazy detour, but, but beloved, listen to me. This is not a detour. I got a, I got a question for you, and I want you to understand this. Get, catch the picture. Who sort of falls on the rock will be broken. How many of you want to fall on the rock? Yeah, you want to fall on the rock. You trust me, you do. The other option is the rock will fall on you and grind you to powder. So the righteous fall on the rock. The wicked will have the rock fall on them. So here's my question. Can you think, can you think of anyone in the Bible, anyone in the Bible who, who had a rock destroy them? This is, a, this is a trick question. Can you think of anyone in the Bible who was destroyed, any man in the Bible that was destroyed by a rock falling on him and grinding him to powder? Can you think of anyone? I've already told you this is a trick question. The answer to the question is found in the book of Daniel, chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, that's right. That dream that Nebuchadnezzar had with a man whose head is of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, toes of iron and clay. Yeah? Uh, 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 it, this is an image. Daniel, or Nebuchadnezzar is having a dream. He doesn't know what the dream means. He can't remember the dream. And then Daniel tells him this is what the dream means. And in the dream, the head of gold represents Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon. The chest and arms of silver represent the kingdom of, of uh, um, Medo-Persia. The belly and thighs of brass represent the kingdom of Greece. And the legs of iron represent the kingdom of Rome. And then what happens at the end of this dream? There is a stone that is cut out without hands that smites, that hits the image on the feet and destroys the imi image, gr grinding it to powder. So here's the thing I want you all to catch up. I know that when we look at Daniel 2, we typically look at it as, oh, this is the story of the kingdoms that reject God, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome. But I need you all to catch this because these kingdoms are represented in the form of a man, meaning could Daniel 2 also be pointing to us that the image you see also represents the man who does not submit himself to Christ. The man who will not fall on the rock and be broken will have the rock fall on him and grind him to powder. You see, beloved, Daniel 2 does not only point to the result of nations that don't follow God, it also points to the result of the man, head, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs, the man that does not follow Jesus. 
And, and now you can begin to see something very powerful, beloved, because each one of these metals, the head of gold, the chestnut of the silver, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, each one of them represent kingdoms. So my question is, could it be that, 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 that when Jesus comes again, he, could it be, beloved, that in man there are these four kingdoms, the kingdom of the mind, the kingdom of the heart, the kingdom of the appetites and desires, the kingdom of our direction and path. Could it be, beloved, that, that Jesus is ultimately trying to conquer these kingdoms? You see, beloved, God is not going to partner with the devil in running your kingdoms. You can't have God here in the mind, oh, I know truth, but not have him in the heart. Y'all catch me. You can't have, say, I got God in my heart, man. I love him, I love him, I love him, but you're not obeying him in the mind. Your desires are not, your, 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 you may say, yes, 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 Lord, but not do, not walk in the direction that he asked you to walk. This is why the Bible tells us, beloved, that, that a, a, a kingdom divided against itself, what? Come on, y'all. A kingdom divided against itself cannot, what? Stand. Why does this image in Daniel 2 fall? The image in Daniel 2 falls. Because whenever you're outside of Christ, you are divided. Whenever you're outside of Christ, you are conflicted. Whenever you're outside of Christ, you don't have balance. Satan and Christ don't partner. Christ is not partnering with Satan. All of the kingdom or none of the kingdom. Jesus is not going to rule your mind while the devil rules your heart. He's not going to rule your appetite while the devil has control of your feet, your path, your direction. No, 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 no. Jesus wants the entire man. Now, you'll remember in Daniel chapter 3, how, how uh, Daniel chapter, chapter 3, correct, Daniel chapter 3, how Nebuchadnezzar comes along because he's just been told in Daniel 2, hey, your kingdom is going to fall. Babylon's going to fall. And Nebuchadnezzar's like, nah, I don't want my kingdom to fall. I don't want to submit to anybody else. So I'm going to set up an entire image of gold. And, and that's how many of us, beloved, are walking around. We're walking around like gold. Let me say this brief. Let me say this clearly. Notice how the metals start off gold, silver, brass, iron. The further you get away from God is the harder you become the more stubborn you become. Until the, the point where you are not iron. I need y'all to understand, in Daniel chapter 3, an entire image is set up of gold saying, I'm not, I'm not, no, my kingdom's not falling. Beloved, let me tell you, Come with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. God wants to control. God wants to be the king of our minds, the kingdom of our minds. God wants to rule the heart. Now a new commandment I give you. A new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. Yes, beloved, God wants to rule the heart. God wants to rule the belly, our appetite. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And beloved, listen to me. God wants to rule our directions. The Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God wants to rule the mind. God wants to rule the heart. God wants to rule the appetite and desires. God wants to rule your, the path that you walk in, beloved. God, in essence, desires to have Jesus formed within you. What do I mean? In order for Jesus to reign here and here and here and here, he's got to be in you. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. So his mind now becomes my mind. His heart now becomes the things that he loves. 
I now love. His desires are now my desires. His path, those that follow, that follow, that walk in the path of the Lamb. Here are they that follow the Lamb with us wherever He goes. Beloved, in order for this to happen, Jesus must be formed within. That's the transformation that he is looking for. So, so when that stone, when that stone that is cut out without hands hits the image on the feet, it's almost as if God is saying, hey, listen, there are two ways we can do this. I can destroy your image now. I can destroy your image now. If you allow me, Jesus Christ, the stone, will come and shatter that whole old man. Make, the stone will shatter you to pieces. And in that place, recreate the kingdom of God in you. The wind will blow away the wind. The spirit of God will blow away that old you. And in its place will rise the kingdom of heaven which is in you. So we can do it now, or you can be like the wicked who, at the end of time, will be destroyed by the coming of Christ. What is it going to be? Beloved, I need you to understand that this symbol of that old man falling is like the symbol of baptism. It's like when the stone comes, when Jesus comes into your life and destroys that old man, it's, it's a symbol of, you, of that old man falling, like baptism. And you rise up a new creature in Christ. You understand? I need y'all to catch this. I need y'all to understand. And we're going to close, beloved. We're, 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 we're wrapping this, this message up by one more point that I need to illustrate to you that is absolutely crucial. You see, baptism is that symbol that your old kingdom falls and the new kingdom of Christ rises within you. Out of the ruins of the old, when you read that image, that story in Daniel 2, when the, when the image fell, a mountain rose up in its place, and that mountain is said to be the kingdom of God. And I need y'all to understand, beloved, that when the old you is destroyed, when that old kingdom is broken to pieces, put a one in the chat if you want your old kingdom to be broken into pieces. When that old kingdom is broken into pieces, beloved, the, the, the spirit of God blows away all the remnants of the old you, and a new man comes up in its place. A new man comes up in that old place. I need y'all to understand that the old man dies and a new man rises up. That's what baptism is about. Now, in light of this, in light of this, beloved, Jesus said, think not that I'm come to send peace on the earth. I came to send a sword. Why does he want to send a sword? Why is he sending the word of God? Listen to me. Jesus himself said, he that lives by the sword must what? Die by the sword. That's the secret right there, y'all. He that lives by the sword must die by the sword. That, that's, that's the secret right there. So if I want to live by the word of God, you'll see it on the screen. Jesus said to his disciples, put up your sword back in its place. Jesus said, all who take the sword will die by the sword. So beloved, if I take the sword, the word of God, I've got to die by the word of God. I've got to die by the word of God. So watch this. Watch this, y'all. Come with me. Revelation 13. We're closing with, this, with these verses. Revelation 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. This beast is seen rising up out of the sea. It's rising up out of the sea. Let me ask you a question. When you think of, a, of, a, of an entity, when you think what, what, sim, what is symbolized by rising up out of water? We were just talking about it. When something or someone rises up out of water, what's going on? What's happening? I shouldn't say what's going on, but what does it remind you of as a Christian if, if someone tells you, hey, someone, and I, and I saw them coming up out of the water. What's the symbol, the Christian symbol? 
It's baptism. Very good. Baptism. John says, I saw a beast rising up out of the water, having seven heads and ten horns. Watch this. And, and his head was like, the beast that I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet is the feet of a bear. His mouth is the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Okay. <clears throat> We know that this beast is a counterfeit. We also know that the world is going to wonder after this beast. Now, we know that the beast in its prior form existed during the Dark Ages, the 1,260 years, prophetically. It was a church system that did really bad things. So why is the world going to be deceived by this system at the end of time, knowing what it did during the Dark Ages. Here's the answer, you all. The beast is seen rising up out of the sea. Symbolically, it's rising up out of the sea. What do we say rising up out of the sea represents? Yes, yes, yes. Baptism, baptism. Could it be possible, beloved, that the reason the world is going to embrace this counterfeit system is because it appears to have changed. <laughs> hey, listen, this is who I was during the Dark Ages. I know I kill people. I know I kill people in the name of Jesus. But look, I've changed. I've been baptized. I've been baptized. Listen, that was then. This is now. Different story. I'm a new creature. But why do we know that this is not true? Why do we know that this is not true? Here's how we know. We know it's not true because the text says that it was only wounded to death. It did not actually die. Let that sink in, y'all. It didn't actually die. It looked changed. It put on a good performance, but it never actually died. Yes, third angel, the beast only had a near-death experience. And beloved, listen to me. A near-death experience is not good enough. You have to die. For Jesus to be formed within you, beloved, requires you to, to, to be totally sold out for Jesus. The problem with this beast is that it was only wounded by the sword. It did not die by the sword. And the problem with so many of us is that we go to church week after week and we get wounded, you know, ow, that hurt, ooh, we get cut up, ooh, ooh. But then the devil comes back and heals us. Because y'all know the devil is into healing too, right? The devil doesn't want us dead. What did he just say? Yeah, y'all, the devil doesn't want us dead. So he will do everything in his power to heal the old man. Oh, man, are you hurt? Yeah, okay. I mean, did, did you get cut up at church today? Yeah. Okay, shh, shh, shh. Here, let me heal you. Let me heal you. Ah, there we go. There we go. All right, there we go. See? You're all better now. Old man is all healed up now. Yes, beloved. That's what he wants. He wants to heal. The, so for many of us, beloved, we, 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 we have deadly wounds, but we never actually die. We would rather Jesus get the sword than us get the sword. We would rather let the child suffer than allow ourselves to suffer. So the devil comes and he heals. 
He doesn't want you to die. Not to self. To die regularly, yeah. But to die to self, nah. Come on, we got to heal him. You're on the you're journey and, you know, the devil and his angel like, clear, clear, Shh, trying to shock you back into, <laughs> into living for self. So, beloved, listen to me. God is calling the people in this judgment that is happening right now. God is calling a people to say, give me Jesus. If you, if you rightly have Jesus, everything else follows. Everything else follows. The commandments follow. True, if you truly possess the child. Now, again, there are people who say, now the child is mine, but you can tell from their actions. You can see from their denial. You can see from, the, from what they deny. The sword? Nah. That's cool. The judgment is about discerning between the good and the bad. And the good are not good because of themselves. The good are good because of what Jesus did for them. The good are good because they accept, they love Christ. The good are good because of Christ being formed within them. So yes, let's, let's tear off the devil's band-aids. Let's, let's say, nah, no thank you. you know, do not resuscitate. Let's allow Jesus to be formed within. Let's be willing to die rather than hurt the son. And beloved, if you have Jesus, you have everything. If you don't have him, you have nothing. I want to close with this statement. Uh, it is a text taken from um, SDA Bible Commentary. Vol I'm sorry. No, no, no. Yep. SDA Bible Commentary, Volume, volume 6. Page 1073, the new birth is a rare experience and in this, in this age of the world, this is the reason why there are so many perplexities in the church. Many, so many who assume the name of Christ are unsanctified and unholy. They have been baptized, but they were buried alive. Self did not die and therefore they did not rise to newness of life in Christ. <clears throat> Beloved, let us be the people that truly possess the Son, that would truly rather suffer then turn our backs on Jesus. If that's your desire, Lord, break me. Get rid of this old kingdom and form that new kingdom within me. Put that one in the chat as we close in prayer. Put that one in the chat as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for showing us that the thing we need most in the judgment is to possess the Son. May he be formed within us, and may the old man, the old kingdom, be destroyed. May its remnants be taken away with the wind, and may a new kingdom rise in its place. May we rather suffer than see the Son suffer, Thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you are uh, interested in the code, in the slides, uh, you'd like to get a hold of these slides, I'm going to invite you to scan the QR code. You will see it on the screen there. Um, if, you have, uh, if you're watching on smartphones, the link is in the chat. Um, I do want to invite you uh, to join us at our altar live, which will also be up in the link here momentarily. Um, and I'm going to make a special appeal for those of you who, who may want to study to be baptized, you have not been baptized before, or you, don't know, you want to learn more about this faith, the, the Seventh-day Adventist understanding of the Bible. I'm going to invite you to join our baptismal class. Uh, we'll put a link up in the chat for that as well. 
And um, uh, uh, please, uh, I encourage you to come to join the studies. I'm personally doing those studies. Uh, they happen every Thursday night, 730. So uh, I want to invite you to that, especially this class is particularly for those who are interested in baptism. Okay. So again, may God bless you. Um, the link for Altar Live is going up now, and I'm going to see you on the Altar Live link where we will discuss this sermon, the notes that you got from this sermon, what the Lord impressed you with, and, um, and may God bless you and watch over you. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If this is your first time worshiping with us, please check out our website at livingmana.church. We are not just here for Sabbath service. We have weekly programming too that covers mental health, physical health, weekly prayer service, financial health, and proving the existence of God. It is our desire that our programming will continue to bless you. Please continue to pray for us as we fulfill God's mission to go into all the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ.